I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Finance Committee of the PBD City Council meeting as the Committee of the Whole. Present for the committee are all city councilors. We have four items on the agenda tonight. First item is an overview of the fiscal year 2022 city PBD operating budget. Second is a review of the city side and FY22 budget for general government, public safety, public services, human services, culture and recreation, debt service, and employee benefits. Third item is a review of the fiscal year 2022 water and sewer budget. And the fourth item is a review of the fiscal year 2022 recreation budget. A few comments uh, tonight, councilors, about how we're gonna approach this. Uh, we are absolutely going to allow adequate time for all counselors to get uh, answers to their questions. And if that means we need to extend a portion of tonight's agenda into Thursday's meeting, or if that means an additional meeting needs to get scheduled, those, those options exist. That said, the council is under an obligation to get through this budget, and my intent is to do that as efficiently as possible. Uh, so to that end, as we get started, the mayor will make his comments and the director of finance will re uh, review the overview presentation. So in the initial round of questions, I'd ask councilors to please limit your questions to what was covered in the mayor's letter. So that's uh, this item. To the overview presentation, so that's the color presentation that you got in advance. Uh, and the PowerPoint that uh, the Director of Finance will review, uh, and, uh, and then leave it at that for the initial round of questions. As we get into the details of the budget, I'd ask the councilors group their questions by major budget sections. So for example, I'd like each councilor that has questions in the general government section to ask their questions to the Mayor and to the Director of Finance or any of the department heads that are here tonight in that, in that general government section uh, in the example. As a reminder, in terms of our, uh, the limits of our authority here under Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 32, the council may only reduce or reject any amount recommended in the annual budget. So if any councilor wants to make motions to reduce or reject a specific line item, I will entertain those motions. After all, councilor questions have been asked and any motions to reduce or reject have been voted, I will entertain motions on the overall budget by section. I'm sorry, the overall major budget sections. So again, using general government as an example, the motion would be on the amounts in the table of contents section, less any approved reductions. With that as introduction, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, councillors. I hope everybody's doing well. I am pleased to present for your consideration the fiscal year 2022 operating budget for the City of Peabody. Tonight, I will be focusing solely on the city side, as I know we'll be taking up our school budget Thursday evening. First, let me say that the past 15 months of the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us in unimaginable ways and caused each of us to experience moments of grief, frustration, anger and disappointment. For many months, it seemed that on a daily basis, we were getting new information from the federal and state governments. There were new restrictions and new regulations, and oftentimes they were completely different than they were the day before. Despite all the tragedy, hardship, and ever-changing circumstances, our community came together, adapted, and persevered. My pride in Peabody continues to grow, and now we can look forward to much brighter days ahead. It is a great tribute to our dedicated city workers who adapted to changes brought on by the pandemic to help keep our city safe and operational. Their contributions during these difficult times are immeasurable, and we are forever grateful to them. I want to make special mention of the Peabody Health Department. 
Sharon Cameron, her outstanding team of nurses, administrators, and countless volunteers who stepped up when our city needed them most. I also want to recognize Peabody's first responders, including the men and women of the Peabody Police Department, Peabody Fire Department, and Atlantic Ambulance, who deserve great credit for the skill and professionalism they demonstrate every day on our behalf. I want to thank our city finance team, led by Mike Jingris and our city auditor, Mary Martin, for their many hours of hard work and assistance in preparing for this budget. Over the past few months, we have worked with our department heads, who are all here tonight, and school officials who will join us Thursday night to produce a balanced budget which helps our city recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, deliver the municipal services our residents and business owners expect, and maintain the affordability and quality of life for which Peabody is recognized and celebrated. Tonight, I propose a fiscal year 2022 budget of $163,243,246. This amount represents an increase of $6,249,145, or 4% from fiscal year 2021, and $4,406,306, or 2.8% from fiscal year 2020, which was the last pre-COVID city budget. Let me repeat that last part for emphasis because I think it's an important point. This budget reflects a 2.8% increase from the last pre-COVID budget of 2020. Although we are still experiencing revenue shortfalls in several categories, including hotel and meals tax, federal relief provided by the American Rescue Plan Act, I'll be referring to it as ARPA tonight, allows for revenue replacement, which we utilize to fill the revenue gaps created by the effects of COVID-19. We do expect additional guidance on allowed uses of ARPA funds and will continue to adapt to those guidelines. One use of ARPA funds, which I think all of you know, is that these funds are not allowed to be used to reduce the property tax burden on our residents and businesses and business owners. Although we have more information now than we did this time last year, we still face a good deal of uncertainty in our financial outlook. Although we, were although we will monitor changing revenue circumstances throughout the summer and fall right up until tax classification, we expect an average increase between $180 and $200. What I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, is that we move forward as we did last year and schedule meetings in the fall leading up to December's tax classification hearing so we can give a clearer picture of our city finances and tax projections, and we can work out that schedule. And despite temptation to spend ARPA funds with reckless abandon, like a kid in a candy store, we must think instead of the long term. These funds will expire, and when they do, we do not want to be left with a gaping hole in some future budget. Most of the fiscal year 2022 budget increase can be attributed to personal services, $3.2 million. This budget restores staffing and services to pre-pandemic levels. It also provides funds to help meet the needs of a growing, vibrant, post-pandemic Peabody. Allow me to outline a few of the major provisions, beginning with public safety. This budget provides for our city's full complement of police officers and firefighters by restoring their ranks to pre-COVID levels as soon as possible. This certainly has been very much on my mind and is a very high priority as I know it is with many of you who have reached out to me on this. I want to give more details. During the pandemic, most police and fire academies were canceled. Now, finally, that there are academies running, spots for candidates in these academies are very competitive. For this reason, we have developed a comprehensive year-long timeline in order to fully staff both departments. Our current police department hiring timeline is as follows. Wheels are in motion right now to hire 15 reserve police officers from our current police list. A new police list is expected to be certified in the fall, and we plan to hire additional reserve police officers from that list. Fortunately, we have two of our reserve police officers in a police academy that opened last week. We plan to send three additional reserve police officers to an academy this fall, hopefully September. 
We will continue to secure spots for our reserve police officers in police academies. Hopefully they'll be scheduled in November, January, and March, and we will be putting in as many officers as we can as those academies allow. But again, all of these positions are funded in this budget. Our current fire department hiring timeline is as follows. We plan to hire four of our current reserve firefighters as permanent full-time firefighters this summer, and we'll train them in-house and send them to an academy in the fall, hopefully in September, if spots are available. We plan to hire three additional permanent firefighters from our reserve list before the end of this calendar year, and we'll send them to a fire academy later this year, depending on when it is held. We, we plan to hire about a dozen reserve firefighters from our current fire list. We, re we will be able to do so as soon as we get far enough along in our reserve police hiring process. Both Chief Griffin and Chief Daly have been strongly adv advocating for the departments as they always have. We've been working with them on, the, them on this plan and we think we can achieve what we need for our department. Council on Aging Director Carolyn Wynn is here tonight and the work she and her staff and many volunteers performed during the pandemic is simply incredible. Even though the senior center doors were closed, our seniors continued to receive meals, attention and care throughout the pandemic. Carolyn is ready to provide further details regarding these efforts. I want to thank Carolyn and her team on behalf of our city and our seniors. In previous years, the city budget would fund approximately 50% of the payroll and operations at the Senior Center. Due to COVID, however, the Senior Center's ability to generate revenue has been seriously impacted. As a result, this budget tonight funds Senior Center payroll and operations at 86% for a total of $708,271. Another unsung hero of the pandemic has been Kate Merlin and her team at the library. Closed during much of the pandemic, the main branch reopened in April, and I'm pleased to report that both branches, the South Peabody branch and the West Peabody branch, opened yesterday. This budget restores a total of $171,813 for part-time lab library staffing and funds a full-time senior librarian. I'm asking tonight for funding of an IT network administrator. As you know, the headlines are scary. Across the country, businesses and government agencies are being victimized by ransomware attacks. Hackers gain access to networks and threaten to shut down them or expose the personal information of employees or customers unless a heavy ransom is paid. Here in Peabody, our excellent IT team, led by Frank Wynn, who is here, is doing everything they can to prevent such an attack from happening here, but they need more help to protect us. I'm also moving to bring back the position of business liaison. This is a key position which has been unfulfilled. In order to continue our progress in revitalizing the downtown and enticing more businesses to Centennial Park and other areas of the city, we need someone focused exclusively on attracting new business and retaining and assisting existing ones. I'm also moving forward tonight with a request for a part-time housing specialist. This was a, an idea generated by the city council that I think was right on point. It was brought up during our discussions on affordable housing. That program was in place uh, for a number of years. It was uh, let go some years ago when the person at the time in charge of that program retired and I think it is time to bring it back. Peabody's good quality of life and affordability continue to make Peabody a very desirable place to live and raise a family. Housing development proposals are at an all-time high, as all of us know, and this person will be doing a tremendous resource for all of us going forward. We will need additional funds, and that's why I've put it in right now as a part-time position, because we will need additional funds from uh, Community Preservation, Community Development Authority, and also from block grants. So further information on that will be forthcoming as that's developed. But it is something we need to move forward on. A focus of mine this year is the necessary enhancement of our emergency management team. 
This budget provides additional funds to establish a more formalized emergency management team to ensure continuity of government services in the event of an emergency. If the past 15 months have taught us anything, it's that we must be prepared for the unexpected in an increasingly un unpredictable world. I'm also requesting one additional full-time nurse. I spoke earlier of the tremendous job that Sharon Cameron and her team in the Health Department have done for us throughout this year, and particularly during the pandemic. The budget includes funds to add a full-time nurse to Sharon's team. These are the major drivers of the personal services budget increase. If you have questions regarding those that I have outlined or others included in the budget, we are certainly ready to answer them. In closing, I want to thank the City Council for being outstanding partners with my administration. Your job has not been easy, and the uncertainty of the pandemic has strained all of your heartfelt efforts to move Peabody forward. But I'm optimistic for the future, and working together we can make a positive difference for our residents. I respectfully request your support for this budget, which again helps our city recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, deliver the municipal services our residents and business owners expect, and maintain the affordability and quality of life for which Peabody is known throughout the region and across our state. Um, I'm gonna turn it over shortly to Mr. Gingras uh, for the presentation. And as outlined by Mr. McGinn, we are here to answer any questions, both myself, the finance team, and all of our department heads that are here tonight. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to having this, the, the discussion on this important budget. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Gingras. Thank you, Councilors. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, build on what the Mayor uh, outlined in his remarks and um, try to expand on it a little bit further. Uh, this first slide, um, we're looking at comparing FY 2020, where we had a budget of $158.8 million, compared to last year's budget, where we saw a reduction um, to $156.9 million. That represents uh, a $1.8 million decrease. Now, when we're looking at our FY 2022 budget, which is the fourth column down, we're at the 163.2 million. That's $6.2 million increase from last year and a $4.4 million increase over two years ago. And if you look at the city side alone, it's only 2.65% increase over two years ago, which is typically um, what we would see year to year. This next slide, um, we'll look at the different budget changes by expense type. And if you look at the table below, it goes in descending order. The mayor talked about the personal services increase at 3.2 million. And that's made up of a number of components, one of which is 1.2 million for an added payroll this, uh, this budget year. We're gonna have 27 pay dates during the budget year, and that's atypical, something that happens every nine or 10 years. Um, so that accounts for 1.2 million out of the 3.2. The other um, components are 600,000 for police and fire, 700,000 for council on aging, and there was 170,000 plus for the library part-time wages. The total of those few items is almost 82% of uh, that increase. The employee benefits increased 618,000. It's primarily driven by pension the pension costs increased 850,000, 850, but that's offset by a little bit of savings we're having in health insurance because Maya is giving, giving us a premium holiday um, in October, this October, um, even though they did increase our um, medical rates, there was some savings at the trust and, and they're passing them along to their members. 
Another important increase was professional services. As the mayor alluded to earlier, we're adding some IT services, um, increases in the solid waste disposal and facilities, and that primarily the 488,000. Capital outlay increases 179,000. Of that, 150,000 is adding back the sidewalk budget to what it was in 2020 at 150,000. Those are the major drivers in um, the 4.5 million that uh, this, this budget is increasing by. This next slide shows the overall budget by function combined with cities and schools. You see the largest increase is in education of 1.7 million, followed by public safety and 1.4 million. Human services, which is primarily Council on Aging and Health at 910,000. Employee benefits that I just talked about. Um, public works increased at 580,000 which is again the 150,000 for sidewalks, 200,000 in facilities, 200,000 in solid waste. There's a $525,000 increase in general government. There's several positions that the mayor spoke to that, that are included there, in addition to an uh, outside company to help us with our cyber uh, monitoring. Culture and recreation increases too, primarily driven by parks and library and a small amount from Tilly's. And we had a slight reduction in debt service this year at $36,000. This slide looks at the budget in terms of a pie. And this is just the um, overall budget where education is taking 50% of the budget. Last year it was 51%. All of the other portions are the same as last year, with the exception of culture and recreation, which went from 2 to 3 percent. There's that 1 percent change that we talked about in education. So it shows that um, the allocations are, fair, are fairly stable and consistent uh, year to year with our, our budget and our providing resources. This slide is showing the actual 2021 budget as opposed to our proposed 2022 budget. The school budget will come in at 76,604,000. The vocational school, which is an increase of 1.75 million. The vocational school assessment is down slightly $9,000 and is coming at 4.3, almost 4.4 million. And the city budget increases 4.5 to 82.2 for a total of 163.2 or an increase of 6.2 million, which is just shy of 4%. In addition, state and county assessments are increasing. Our current um, look at the um, state and county assessments is based on the Senate version and we're waiting on the conference committee version. And that increases 198,000. We're keeping abatements the same at 500,000. Um, that would leave us approximately a million dollars in reserve heading into the year. And uh, we had obligated to raise one third of the deficit last year, this coming year and the next year. And the 762,000 is, is that amount. So the total amount to be raised is the budget of 163.2 million, 4.8 million of the other amounts I just discussed for a total of 160, just a little over 168 million or 6.4 million increase over last year. The sources of revenue will be used, or we anticipate, to fund this budget. Our available revenues, a million dollars from free cash, 
approximately 175,000 from various sources such as parking meter fund, health insurance trust. The ARPA fund, which is 3.3 million to help with revenue um, offsets. The state aid right now is at 32.2 million, which is $1.1 million increase. We're hoping to keep local revenues status quo at 17.7 million. Cur currently, it's um, trending low in terms of hotel and restaurant. Um, and in your budget package, the uh, We'll get to into the next slide. It's uh, estimated through May 21st. So by the end of this summer, we'll be able to take a good look at what's there and, and uh, evaluate what our needs are going to be. And, and when we meet again in the fall, we'll have a further discussion on that. Currently, the anticipated tax levy would be 113.6 million, which represents a $2.3 million increase, and that's the um, sources of revenue that we would use to fund the budget. This next slide takes a look at the uh, estimated local revenues. Again, the third column in the middle was the receipts as of May 21st. You can see that it was a little bit behind in a couple of areas, motor vehicle excise, hotel meals, and in uh, license and permits, it was down a little bit too. We anticipate, like I said, um, really scrubbing through these numbers in, in trying to anticipate and estimate going forward to try to hold to this 17.75 number. We have a, a great deal of motor vehicle excise tax that we've billed um, just recently. I, I don't expect it would all come in in this fiscal year. So I will be able to make an argument to the Department of Revenue that that number will bump up similar argument with, with hotel and meals tax because the state has given an allowance to those folks that the, the payments are not due until October, so we wouldn't see that until the next fiscal year. And we still have to scrub through all the other um, local receipts and reevaluate the, them as we get the final numbers in in, during the summer. This next slide it looks at the values. The residential values are estimated to increase about 4.5%. That's a $320 million increase. And as you know, the market's really been crazy um, for residential. Commercial, we have a kind of a mixed bag. We have a um, agreement with the mall for a decrease of 10 million that happened prior to the pandemic. And we're also looking at a decrease of approximately 15% in hotels and motels. That could be offset because we're seeing gains in warehouses. So once all of those final numbers in, this um, commercial industrial value may decrease a little bit more. Our new growth, the next amount down that shows 20,000 or 20 million and 20 million, sort of a placeholder because we generally, for the past 10 years, have generated a million dollars in new tax revenue. I anticipate that'll hold. Um, currently, we're using 653,000 in this estimate. Our levy limit has climbed to 131 million. That's the total amount we would be allowed to tax without an override. The proposed tax levy that we're um, estimating would be 113.6 million. So that leaves 17 and a half million 
in overlay reserve. In other words, that's money that can be taxed in the future given unforeseen circumstances, um, increases in debt service uh, with, without having to do an override. This next slide kind of summarizes everything. It shows the breakdown between the commercial and the residential levy. And you'll see that because of the decline in uh, commercial value compared to residential value, it is very likely that the commercial uh, real estate payments will be less in this coming year and the residential um, bills will be more. The estimated average residential value is 458,000. That's a 19.7 thousand increase. And, and the projection based on what we, what we know today is approximately $188,000 increase. $188,000, no, it's $188 increase in the average tax bill. This next slide gives you a picture of what our reserves look like. We started July 1st with 9.1, almost 9.2 million in free cash, 3 million in stabilization for total reserves of 12.2 million. There's one transfer request pending for 400,000. I'll be working on another transfer request to be submitted at the end of the week where we'll capture snow and ice and uh, expense tr expenses overruns. That could be around 845,000. And I also put in here a rink that you'll see going fo forward in the presentation where the rink deficit looks to be about 165,000. However, with ARPA funding and, and um, revenue replacement, we will likely be able to not have to um, come in for that request. In addition, if you look under stabilization, we're adding 125,000. If you recall from a couple of years ago when we had the fire at Coolidge, we pledged for 10 years we would add back to the stabilization 125,000 a year. That continues. So at June 30th, the estimate is about 7.8 million in free cash, three point, almost 3.2 million in stabilization, or close to 11 million in reserves. The estimated use of free cash or reserves for funding the FY22 budget is $1 million. That would bring that down basically to, to after that to just under around $10 million. So to summarize the city side of the budget, the total budget of $163.2 million, which is an increase of $6.2 million or 3.99%. An estimated property tax levy of 113.6 million, use of local revenues of approximately 17.75, local available revenues of 1,175,000, and our local aid right now at 32.2 million. And then we're using revenue relief from the COVID funds of 3.3 million. The next section of the presentation will review the enterprise funds. We begin with the water and sewer enterprise. In the left column, the, the first, um, we'll take a look at last FY 2020. Our actual receipts were 17.6 million. This year we're projecting 19.5 we definitely had collections that we didn't receive during COVID and we picked up on that. And those look fairly strong through closing out this year. 
and amusing rounding back down 19.475 million for the FY 2022 budget. This next slide shows the sewer expense or the sewer side of the budget. The actual budget for FY 2020, we spent almost 9.6 million. We're currently on track to spend approximately that same amount again, 9.6 million projected for FY 2020. And then the budget for FY 2022, we have a couple of increases. One is um, personal services, salary and wages. And another is the SESD assessment is up almost 200,000. So that increase um, increases the sewer portion of the budget up to a little over 10 million for FY 2022. The water portion of the water and sewer enterprise actual expenses last year came in at 9.4 million. As you can see, under the MWRA water purchase, that's the year we had, ex had to expend or pay back MWRA for money or for water we used the previous calendar year for the Coolidge water treatment when the Coolidge water treatment plant was down. The current budget was 1.3 million. It was a dramatic decrease in MWRA water. So that budget is anticipated to come in at about 6.5 million. We have some overage and outside services for water main breaks and overtime um, to, for coverages because of short staffing in all areas of water treatment. The FY 2022 budget, the, the um, salaries will increase again, along with the other departments. Um, the MWRA will increase $1 million. A lot of that had to do with the pipeline work in the shutdown as part of the Winona um, rehab. And you'll see an increase in materials and supplies to 795,000. We're beginning a water re meter replacement project. There's some extra money in there to, to purchase some radio meters, but this is gonna be a, a full-scale project, and this is sort of just starting it where we're gonna do a comprehensive citywide replacement of meters that could be read remotely. Um, debt service you'll see too in this budget is up significantly because the um, SRF funding um, that we received from the state for the water transmission lines is starting to um, come on board. Um, the good news is by going through the SRF funding, we got a 2.4% rate. And in addition to that, they forgive, forgave principal between Two of those projects, approximately $900,000 that we spent and we don't have to pay back. <clears throat> so this next page gives you the overview of the water and sewer enterprise. If you look at FY 2020, in the first column, revenues received 17.6 million operating expenses of 19, a little over 19 million. So we had that deficit of 1.3 million that we closed at the end of last year. The DOR allowed us to roll that forward without having to raise it because they um, understood that we had a, a good amount of receivables to be collected, allowed us to roll it forward. We anticipate this year collecting much of that for a total receipt of 19.5 million against 16 point, almost 16.2 million in expenses and 638,000 in debt service. That would give us a net revenue of about 2.6 million, less the uh, roll forward of the deficit. So we should end this, this fiscal year in June with about 1.3 million in the uh, water sewer enterprise. And looking forward to next 
uh, FY22. Again, anticipating another 19 and a half million with a budget of 17.1. We should get gross profit from operations of a little over 2.3 million. Against our debt service of 1.3, we're gonna have a gross profit or net, re net revenue just under a million dollars at 981,000. Adding that to the reserve or roll forward of retained earnings, we should be approaching 2 million or a little over 2 million in, in retained earnings that we could start utilizing for those water uh, meter replacements and other projects in the water department. This next slide, we're gonna, we're gonna look at the skating rink and the golf course individually, and it, then at the end, I have a slide that combines everything into one recreation enterprise. So looking at the uh, skating rink's revenues last year, with the COVID and shutdown quite a bit of time, they came in with $543,000. This current year, we're projecting a little bit more, even though they were closed several times, at $591,000. And generally, they generate around $700,000 in a normal season. So for the FY 2022 budget, we're using $690,000 as our target revenue um, amount. Looking at the expenses at the skating rink for 2020, obviously with the COVID, um, we cut back on a lot of items and the operating expenses came in at 654,000 with that, that service that was 749,000 total. This current year, um, similar circumstance, we're at 586,000. 830 is a projection of operating expenses plus 93,000 in debt service for a total expenditure of approximately 680,000. The budget for next year at FY 2022, we have an increase. We have to get our utilities back up to you know, wh where they would, would normally be um, with full operations and our repairs budget stayed strong around 40,000. The operating expenses are slightly less than budgeted last year at 673,000 versus 674,000. And the debt service has reduced $2,000 approximately to 91,000. For a total expenditure budget at the skating rink of 765,500. This next slide gives you the overview of the um, skating rink revenues and expenses and retained earnings. The actual revenues of in 2020, 543,000. Operating expenses of 654,000. Here's where we had a loss of, of gross profit of 110,000. Plus we had a pay debt service of 95. So our net revenue deficit or deficit overall was 205,000. However, we had some retained earnings of 93,000. So at the end of the day, when we closed out last year, we were $112,000 short. And we raised a third of that in tax, in, on the tax rate. And that's the 37,000 you see at the bottom there. The, the projection for this year, 591,000 in revenue against 586,000 in expenses. So there's a small profit where we, we've taken in more than we spent in operating the rink. De after debt service, we'll have about an $88,000 um, deficit. If you add that to the 112 carried forward from the prior year, less the one third that was raised, we're looking at about $163,000 close out at the end of this calendar year, or fiscal year. And then for the FY 2022 budget, we're budgeting 690,000 in revenue. The 
actual operating budget is 673,000, which you can see there, a, a small surplus of 16,000 to go towards debt service of 91,000. So we would have to um, support the skating rink budget by 75,500 for FY 2022. The, the numbers below that show the 163 carried from the past two years, less amount to be raised. There's that one third of 37,000. So at the end of the day next year, if we had continued the skating rink as a separate budget, it would be about $200,000 in deficit. Now we're gonna move on to the golf course. The golf course revenues for 2020 came in at 1.2 million, and they were closed due to COVID and had a very late opening late last spring. They accounted for some of that um, reduction. Currently, um, everyone's golfing, and we're anticipating over 1.6 million in revenues. It's the highest revenue. Um, that, golf course has ever achieved. And we're gonna carry that number in for next year's budget at 1.69 million. The golf course is broken out into two expense departments. One is the clubhouse, the actual cost at the clubhouse for FY 2020 is 382,000. We projected this year at 536,000 and then next year at 579,000. We're pretty much staying in line. We brought back some supplies for grill room and um, pro shop as things open back up um, and, and some slight increases in the uh, personal services. The next uh, portion of the golf course budget is the grounds. The golf grounds actual was 517,000 in 2020. This year we're projecting it at, come in at around 532,000 overall. But everything's fairly consistent within these line items. And then for FY 2022, we've added $200,000 in capital improvements to take care of some of the needs at the golf course. And the next slide, um, list a few of those things that comprise the um, request from Eric Still, the golf course superintendent, who's developing a five-year capital improvement program. This is year one um, to, to go through and update things. The golf course is over 20 years old now, and a lot of things need replacing. Some of the things on this list is the, the roof at the maintenance shed, um, irrigation and control boxes, um, some cart path, sprinkler heads, a, num a number of items for this current year and, and, and beyond. Uh, the next slide shows the golf course's uh, revenue expense and uh, retained earnings totals. In FY 2020, we generated 1.2 million. We had operating expenses of 900,000. So we had a gross profit from operations of 346,000, which went towards our final debt service payment, which was made in 2020, leaving um, a shortage of 143,000. But we had some retained earnings of 120. So at the end of the um, fiscal year last year, we had a very small deficit of $23,000, which we were able to roll forward. And in this year's projections, we have 1.6 million in revenue against a little over a million in operating expenses, which should generate over 600,000 in gross profit from operations. Um, we need to begin paying back the um, community development loan, which will be 100,000 a year for the next 15 years. I'll be adding that to one of the requests coming up at the end of this week for this 100,000. And um, so if you go 
Further down, you see that at the end of this year, we would anticipate about $490,000 in um, retained earnings. In the event um, for FY 2022 budget, at 1.69 million against an operating budget of 1.3, almost 1.4 million. We'd have 303,000 in gross profit, pay back the CDA loan, generate an additional 200,000 in retained earnings to add to the 493,000 that was there. So we would have ended up at 696,000. And this is the way it would have been if we kept things separate. But the next slide combines the recreation enterprise of the skating rink and golf course. And you'll see revenues, skating rink, revenues, golf course. And it's, and it's, it's the um, FY 2020, what it would have looked like. So total revenue for FY 2020 would have been 1.79 million against 155, $1,555,000 in loss, I mean in expense. We generated a gross profit of 235,000 against debt service of 584,000, leaving a, a net deficit of 349,000 we had retained earnings in both entities, golf and rink. So at the end of the day, we would have been short 135,000, which was um, 23,000 at the golf course and the balance at the skating rink. This year's projection, if combined, would be 591,000 at the rink, 1.6 million at the golf course for 2.2 million in revenue against an operating expenses of 1.6 million, which would generate a gross profit of 600,000, less the skating rink debt service of 93,000, the CDA loan of 100,000, which would give us net revenue of 427,000. We would absorb the prior year deficit and it, at the end of the year have about 300,000 left in retained earnings. The projection for the recreation enterprise going forward for FY 2022 is a budget of 2.38 million for revenue, just over 2 million in total ex operating expenses, 91,000 in debt service for the skating ring, rink, and I left out the $100,000 payment to CDA in the budget, and we'll have to add that um, when we get to that section. At the end, so it, so um, we would end up with net revenue of 127,000, and add that to what's in retained earnings. So we'd end up at the end of the, at the end of the year with about 400,000 plus in retained earnings in the in the new um, recreation enterprise. Thank you, Mr. Chingris. Questions from councilors? Councilor Saslaw. Thank you, Chairman, again. Um, first, I'd like to apologize. It's always tough to talk and people are sitting behind you, but um, I, I did want to start off and uh, echo the comments of the mayor and thank the staff, um, the mayor, his staff, all the employees across the city. Uh, I think it was a trying year and I, and I think you, you did a tremendous job. I, I really do, and uh, I think the mayor covered most of the departments that I would also cover. But I think everyone as a whole did a tremendous job, and I, and I personally want to thank you for that. And you know, being a ward councilor, um, to be quite frank with you, you know, a lot of times if they call with an issue, when they call the mayor's office, and the mayor's office just you know tries to handle it, but usually they'll ask them to reach out to the ward council. And I, and I have to tell you that you know, the, the calls were minimal, and, and I and I think that just speaks volumes for the work that you folks did. Uh, during the entire pandemic, so I, I personally once again want to, want to thank you for that, and I'm happy to see you. And I want to thank the mayor for opening City Hall on Monday. I think that's another great, great achievement that we're we're doing. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, first of all the fact that we had no layoffs. Once again, I think that speaks volumes uh, that we're able to do that. 
it was a tough time and to be able to not have any layoffs I think speaks once again about the city cares about their employees and um, the families that are employed in the city of Peabody. Um, but I, I did want to talk a little bit about some of the positions that uh, the mayor proposed tonight. And, and um, basically I'm, I'd like to concentrate mainly on, on, on the new ones, um, not all of them, but I, I did have one quick one about the, um, regarding the, um, let's see, the, the half secretary board of appeals. And is that, um, is that the ZBA or is that a different board? I'm just curious and is that position, have we been operating without that position? That was 20,700 was the amount. Thank you, Mr. Jingus, for reminding me. And Councilor, thank you very much for those kind comments. Um, as I said, it's been very difficult for, for uh, all of you, and I know uh, there's been a number of calls um, that have come your way that you've struggled to answer, all of you, because of just the way things were. Uh, so I appreciate those kind comments. Um, that is for, we have had that position as a part-time position. That's Kyla McGrath, who's the Zoning Board of Appeals um, Secretary. Yep. As all of you know, because we've been living with it for the last couple of years, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals has become an extremely busy office. And I think it's going to continue to be for at least the foreseeable future. So I did move to uh, make that from a part-time position to a full-time position. And it's Kyler McGrath did uh, take that position. Okay, thank you. So we're going from half to one, okay. Um, regarding the IT network administrator, I understand that and the, 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 the way we, the world we live in today. I, I was just curious, um, does the IT network administrator, do you see them working in conjunction with the school department because we have a whole ID depart IT department at the school department? And I'm just curious if there's been any collaboration. I know it's tough because the school department's not here, but I was just curious as I was looking at the position, I, I thought maybe there was maybe a little bit of collaboration. I was just curious and if you thought about that at all. Just, just throwing it out there. No, that's a good question. And yes, there has been, uh, there's been some collaboration, but they are on different platforms. A lot of their programs with the school department being separate from our city end. Uh, I know our city department in particular, Frank, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gwynn, has, um, he does the fire department, the golf course, uh, a number of different departments. And, um, you know, we've been able to sustain as the way we are now, but with this ever increasing threat of, of hacking, it's, it's real. I know of some cities, probably you do as well, that have really experienced this and it's devastated their community. So, yeah, there has been some uh, collaboration, but there's some areas where they cannot collaborate, they're just separate, separate systems. Thank you, and I would just encourage that uh, Frank reach out to that new IT person, uh, you know, have the new IT person maybe just uh, reach out to the uh, school department because I'm sure there's some cross-functionality and it's always good for them to, to talk. Um, one of the positions, I, I don't think I see it here, but you didn't get into it, and I was just curious, George Peabody House, $25,000. Can you just elaborate what that is for? Yes, that was a position, that was a, uh, we cut that last year uh, because of, of, of where we were with COVID. I just wanted to reinstitute that to allow for some continued hours over there. There is a great deal of work that happens there quietly, and, and we do have a uh, constituency that uh, does visit the George Peabody House. Primarily the people that work there are volunteers. Uh, we pay them a small stipend, but uh, Dick St. Pierre uh, runs it. We have a curator that we also hire on a part-time basis. Uh, but we're just looking to be able to, to utilize the George Peabody House for a couple days a week, and that's what the 25000 is for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And regarding the part-time housing specialist, I know you covered it. Can you just give maybe um, a little bit of more insight on, as opposed to, you know, what that job uh, functionality is, what, what they actually w will do? Yes. So that is a position, um, it was Jack Chella was the last person to have that position and that, had a, that was before I was mayor. And um, primarily his responsibility and what he worked on was working with the building inspector's office uh, to provide loans to homeowners in the city for emergency work, primarily roof repairs, maybe a boiler went out, um, um, you know, other, uh, other um, 
things that happen in a household and it's, you know, usually runs five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, sometimes more depending on the need. And it's a loan that's paid back if they sell the property. If they have the property for 15 years, then it's forgiven. Uh, so it's, um, it's a benefit to our residents, particularly those that might be in dire need of immediate assistance. And also it's a benefit to the city because once we do um, enter into a loan agreement with a, uh, a resident, that does count towards our affordable numbers. So for the past 10 years, and it was brought up well at an earlier meeting, uh, that um, after those period of time when those loans are forgiven, they come off our books. So over the years, our numbers have gone down 10, 20 units per year. Um, and I do think that one, it helps us with our affordable numbers, and two, I think it's a good benefit to some residents. Thank you, I, I appreciate that explanation. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we did a great job, you did a great job of no layoffs. Um, and, and my only concern when we add new positions is I hate to fund a position and then if we remove it, someone loses employment and they lose their job. And, you know, as I look at these five and a half, six jobs that we're adding, um, you know, usually, quite frankly, they don't, they don't go away. And this is an increase of uh, $266,000 per year. It won't be going away. Um, and so I have some reservations. I have some concerns. You've explained in detail. My, my, you've answered my questions about what they do. As I said, some I did not bring up. I think they're self-explanatory. But uh, I, I, just something that I, I just want to express. Um, moving down a little bit, um, I'll just say this. On behalf of all the other ward councilors, $150,000 for sidewalks, that's great. If we can never get any more, <laughs> we love it. <laughs> um, you talked about more, in your, in your narrative, you talked about more formalized emergency services team. And then you elaborated, you said continuity of government services. I'm just trying to understand that a little bit. I, I know when 9-11 hit, we added some, uh, we added some, we added some positions or we added some, some duties. Is this, um, can you maybe just touch upon that? And I didn't go out and figure out where it was added in the budget or anything. I just wanted maybe if you could, you could elaborate on you know, what you're looking for to happen. Yeah, that's a good question. I should have maybe um, delved into that a little bit deeper. So what I proposed in the budget, I think we were at about, and I'm going to just use round numbers. Um, I could look them up, but I'm going to use round numbers. I think we funded it at about $10,000, which is significantly low. Uh, Chief Daly runs the emergency management team. Primarily that was a stipend for him and his department, as well as for some of our uh, health uh, department workers. Um, and I just found that very lacking. It didn't provide us with um, funds to purchase materials and other things we need. I don't anticipate that there'll be any hiring for emergency management. I think that'll just be uh, for internal um, use, purchasing of materials, supplies, uh, I think it's going to be a combination, and, and I can at a later time, maybe a couple months out or a few months out, come in with a more detailed um, breakdown of what we're looking to do with those funds. But I imagine it will be our public safety, police and fire, our health department, our IT department, human resources, uh, those departments um, working together to purchase some supplies and materials as needed. I just bumped it up about 50000 and I just thought that that would provide the seed money we need to, to enhance our operation. I just think it was lacking. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, regarding the uh, American Reserve Plan Act that uh, you referred to and that I read, read about here, um, so I saw that fiscal year 2022, we're expecting $3.3 million. Um, is, is that a number that you're comfortable? And my follow-up is, is this something that Congress is looking to extend into fiscal year 2023, or is it just a one-year deal? I can speak a little bit about that, but I think it's probably best to, to defer over to Mr. Jingris on this. Uh, he could probably give a better explanation. Uh, those funds, um, first, yeah, we're comfortable with, with that number. Um, we currently have received in hand 5.3 million. The, the city of Peabody was allocated uh, direct allocation of over $10 million. We will receive that in two pieces, one piece this year, one piece a year from now. And in addition to that, we're um, 
supposed to get allocated another $10 million through the state based on the population through Essex County of approximately $10 million. And that's a separate application, and it's not direct to us. We have to apply through the state. The program runs from, the, they use December as the benchmark date, so it, and it runs to 2023. And you said that we received five, in excess of five million. Am I to assume that the other two is probably gonna be, is that with the school budget? No, that other two will probably get us out of this current year. Okay. Um, I was gonna turn to, to page nine um, regarding the fiscal 22 budget projections of local revenues. You know, you know better than anybody, Mike, that the first four items, uh, is, you know, we have a deficit of approximately three million if you take out the, the water and the sewer, and out of that deficit of approximately three million, you know, a large point of it, 1.7 is the first four items. Um, so, you know, we'll, I know you'll keep a good eye on that. My question for you was, this was through May of 2021. Uh, do you expect, you know, that we'll get, uh, and I want I don't know if I, it's as simple as taking 12 and divide it into 14 million. Is it, is it safe to assume that maybe, well, I'm not gonna assume. In June of 2021, what do you think the revenues might be? Uh, what, what your thoughts are? In, in a normal year, I'd be able to look at the prior year and see what we collected and project. But with, with uh, you know, everything that's happened, that's really hard. But what I can tell you is I looked at it today, and it's up about a million from, from, this, um, from this run. And it'll take into a week or two into July till we get everything posted. And, and then, you know, once we really see where we're at, and, and as I indicated before, the, there's some negotiation with the Department of Revenue where we could, we anticipate receiving money that we didn't actually um, come in where we wanted it to in the current year, and they, they'll allow us to do that if we have a good reason. And, and so the, really the goal is to try to maintain as close to this 17.7 .7 number as we can. Thank you. Uh, moving along to page 10, you, you made a comment about the North Shore Mall, and we, we negotiated a uh, tax agreement with them, if I heard you correctly, was that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So my question is, is would you expect, uh, can they come back and negotiate based upon the pandemic and what they agreed to? Is that up for a negotiation or is that an ironclad that we won't be looking at something like that? Well, currently we're adhering to the existing agreement, and I anticipate when January comes um, and we have an, another valuation date that they may come in for uh, tax abatements. Okay, thank you. I, I know you talked a little bit uh, on page 11, a 4.09% increase in the uh, average residential tax bill. Um, did you have a projection in the average uh, bill, whether it be an increase or decrease in the commercial and industrial side of the house properties? No, I right, right now that's kind of a fluid number, and, and I'm not really sure where that's going to land. Um, but what, what I did indicate was it's, it, their tax bills are going to be less. Less. Okay, thank you. Um, Moving to page um, 12, we got in the stabilization fund. Um, just, I see that we're gonna be going down about 20% this year, and, and just for myself and for the people at home, how do we build that back up? I'm, I'm not quite sure, I remember that quite frankly. So we're, we're going down about two million, about 20%. So how does that get, get built, excuse me, built back up? So the, the stabilization itself, since we borrowed from it, we, we um, made a commitment to put 125,000 in every year, and that's coming from the water and sewer enterprise right now. And as far as free cash goes, um, when we do our budgets and we do our revenue projections, hopefully we'll have a little more revenue come in and spend less, and that's how we build the free cash. Understood, thank you for explaining that. Lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, because I'm going to talk about uh, the skating rink and the golf course, we did receive a 
communication uh, from Mike's office, all of us, Monday this week. I'd like to make a motion to receive the history of the golf course and skating rink. So move. Council, as you heard the motion from Council Sasslaw to receive late communication one on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor, any opposed to vote. Thank you. So when I, and I review this and I'm not gonna, one of the things that did concern me is when I looked at, uh, I know you said, I think we have $88,000, it's a projected amount we're gonna be in the hole this year. But I looked at the accounts receivable, uh, what concerns me is the over 90 days. Uh, you know, 30 I can understand, 60 I can understand, 90. Uh, but when you push it out over 90, uh, not over 100, not, excuse me, over 90 days, and those amounts of account receivable are more than 50% of what we're due, and we're trying to kind of close the books out and go into the enterprise fund, I think, as close to uh, clean up as possible. I don't know if this is you, Mike. I don't know if this is uh, the skating week manager, but uh, as you can see, there's also maybe they can can address that amount. Uh, you know, I do. You know, we all read stories about AU programs and things of that nature. As funds that disappear, and I'm just concerned because you know there is a there are, you know there are the top three organizations are all youth programs, and one of them uh, is glaringly out of whack, and I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask that question on behalf of the taxpayers. Yeah, the, the, um, there's a, there are a number of problems that this skating rink has been um, communicating with these organizations and, and um, trying to come to resolution. Um, but they're well aware of these issues and, and continue to uh, you know, proceed to try to make collection. So where we're funding the skating rink with the golf course revenues that are flush with capital, you know, would we uh, absolve these organizations of the debts or do we have an intention to go forward and collect them? I can speak to that as well because that's a very good question. And um, right now we're trying to work with them to, to see if we can um, advance on a payment plan or, or, or uh, just some method of payment. Um, some talks have been helpful, others haven't been. Really, our next step would be uh, a lawsuit. And considering some of those programs, you know, it's not really the ideal thing we want to do, but um, that is something we may have to do depending on the future talks with them. Thank you, Mr. May. I appreciate your frankness on that difficult subject. Um, in closing, um, you know, I must say, I really don't see a lot of fat in the budget. That being said, when you talked in your, uh, the beginning about funding all the previous positions, as I said, I applauded the entire city staff, employees, the minimal phone calls I got. Um, we're adding five and a half positions. I, I was hoping that there was a possibility. As I said earlier, I hate to fund a position and then all of a sudden we're in a situation where maybe we gotta pull it back. Um, I, I was hoping maybe that where well, they did such a great job during the pandemic that maybe there was a position or two that we could still uh, not fill as we live in this uh, very precarious environment knowing what the revenues will or won't be. As you know, we're still waiting from the state house to see what the numbers come in at. Um, so that's my comment uh, and that's how I feel a little bit. And, and, and lastly, uh, I'm still, you know, and I know when I say this, you're gonna, you understand and you know too, but I'm still looking for when those city properties that are gonna be for sale that I think we had one auction and we pulled it back, back in February due to a snowstorm. I, don't, I haven't seen it come before us. Um, the Brody's building, I still get asked about that continually. And, uh, and, and lastly, I, I still thought, and, you know, I, I thought it was a decent suggestion, but the whole sabbatical idea that I told you other, other you know, I understand the, pub, the private companies do it, it's a paid sabbatical, I am not suggesting that. But you know, sometimes a private sabbatic, a sabbatical unpaid, there are many people who have dual household incomes, they do make good incomes, and sometimes they'll take advantage of that opportunity. And, and I know that we talked about this going back to last July, I discussed it with you, and you know, I, I, I welcome the opportunity at any point to maybe talk about that in the future, uh, and like I said, the city properties, but uh, all in all, I appreciate the work and your, your team did, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sasso. Councilor Welton. 
Thank you, Chair McGinn. Um, I have a few questions, and um, I will try to keep it as brief as I can. Um, I do appreciate all the hard work, not only of all of our departments over this last year. I know it's been extre extremely difficult. I also appreciate your time tonight, uh, Mr. Gingras, with walking us through this. I know it's a lot for us to review over the course of a few days, so I appreciate you bearing with us with, uh, with some of our questions as we continue to review. Regarding the ARPA funding, um, I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. As a follow-up to Councillor Saslaw's question, um, I understood the local revenues. Currently, we are down about 3.3 million, and I understand that's uh, as of the, the end of May, so there's still some revenue that will be coming in there. Um, I did a, just a quick calculation based on you know, average monthly intake, and I know that's not exactly how we, we come up with that number, but it looks like we'll be hovering right around the $2 million, at least ballpark, $2 million deficit uh, in local revenues. And you had spoken about uh, Department of Revenue being able to forgive or postpone some of the payments. Um, I think from our conversation this time last year, if, if I remember correctly, that's more on the, uh, the real estate tax side, not so much the local revenues. So my question is with the ARPA funding, I know that the figure we're using for this year is $3.3 million um, for the FY 2022 budget. Are you confident that the 5.2 or thereabout that you spoke about um, prior will be enough to cover our shortfall from FY21 and what we need budgeted here for FY22? Yeah, I, th I think we're going to be okay. Um, like you said, we could be about $2 million short. That's fair. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to work towards down a little bit. Um, we won't necessarily uh, use 3.3, but that's the projection. So currently we have 5.3 million. Uh, it's conceivable between this current fiscal year getting out of it and funding FY22, we utilize all the 5.3 million. Um, what I was referring to with the um, Department of Revenue is even if our um, receipts come in less, if I can make a case for the next year, I can leave them at a higher level. Because ge their general rule is if you didn't collect it, you can't use it. Thank you for clarifying that. Again, um, you know, that, that's helpful to have the context there. And I think my follow-up question was going to be, uh, you know, if not, should we increase that ARPA funding for FY 2022? But it sounds like that we should at least be pretty close to be able to making that work. So. Uh, so that's that's fine. Um, I also just wanted to confirm the 3.2 million in personnel services increase. Uh, that includes all scheduled pay increases, steps, and benefits. No, okay. Is there an additional revenue that's outlined that would include that? No. We would come back to the city council as those contracts became settled. And most likely, they're not all going to be at the same time, so we don't have to absorb a really huge number. And we'll make determinations as they come in of what revenue sources we could utilize. So could I just request maybe uh, the mayor had requested we revisit this in the fall, if, if we could maybe have an update at that point. I think uh, that might just be helpful for us to know kind of where we're, where we're coming in there, um, just understanding that. You know, the 3.2 million is, is to add the additional personnel um, and that there possibly might be more. So I think it would be good for us to know what we're looking at there. Um, and then lastly, could you just explain, and I'm sorry if I missed this or, or just don't understand how it's calculated, but I understand there's an additional pay period this upcoming year. Um, I just, I don't fully understand how that gets to a $1.2 million increase. Could you maybe just provide us a little bit more info on that? Well, <laughs> simply, that what I did was I took all the positions for 26 pay periods, did them for 27 pay periods, did the subtraction, and I came out with 1.2 million. <clears throat> okay, again, so, I apologize if I'm not being clear or if, if I'm misunderstanding it, but uh, if the salary allocation is based on an annual, okay, could you maybe explain that? Because clearly I'm missing something here. Peep, the, the, Every, every so often we, ha we have an extra pay date. 
and we would budget for that pay date during the course of the budget cycle because the people are going to work those two weeks so they wouldn't make less. So we have hourly employees and salary employees. It makes sense. I apologize. I was looking at more from the salary for an annual salary, but speaking of it that way, I, I totally understand. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, and Council Welton, if, I, if you don't mind. Sorry, sure. I, um, it's just something that does happen. It was the first time it happened since I've been mayor where we had 27 pay periods instead of 26. So it wasn't great news to, uh, to receive. That would be an extra 1.2 million. So what that means is next year we go back to 26 pay periods. 1.2 million will come right off. Great, thank you. And again, I apologize. I was looking at more uh, from a salary side versus a, an hourly wage, but that totally makes sense. Uh, so I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, that's it for my questions at this point. I really appreciate all the hard work uh, that you've put together, and I know the departments have been working really hard on these budgets, so I appreciate you indulging us as we continue to, to have some questions, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Welton. Councillor Shress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to first uh, thank all the department heads for all their hard work in putting this, this uh, budget. I, I'm assuming this budget is probably was one of the hardest ones they can to put together um, because of the past years and numbers. Um, and I do know the one way we keep th this community um, desirable to come and live and work and build and build a business is keep our services up. And it would be very easy to pull back and some cut back. As a ward counselor, again, the sidewalks, I just love that. That's, you know, that's what we get the trees, the sidewalks, the roads, things of that nature, the services. So I, I do want to thank every department head here. And I know their hearts are there and they're, and they're good, good people. And trying to get the services to our residents is uh, foremost the most important part of a ward councilor, and I could not do it without them. So I want to thank them and your staff too, Mayor. But with that being said, I said I'm going to have one hard question for you, Mayor. I just don't understand the Falcon. We're tanners. I don't, you know, I know that we have a new resident, but hopefully next year we see the tanner back on this, uh, this budget, all right? So if that was going to be the hardest question for you, I don't know if you want to. <laughs> well, let me comment. respond to that. Let me respond to that. Thank you, Councillor. And um, yes, the sidewalk, just to go back one moment to the sidewalk, I know it's been incredibly frustrating for all of you because a lot of the calls you get are direct constituent services, street paving, sidewalk paving, trees need to be trimmed, um, all of those, those are calls you get. Um, and I know this has been frustrating because you've needed attention and the money's been a struggle for us because we did cut that significantly last year. So now we're back up and I think we'll be in a much better position than to, to attend to those needs. And quite frankly, the Falcon, when we were deciding, we always try to put some sort of good news or some sort of project that we're working on. The only project to speak of this year that was uh, really um, in the works was underground water pipes, and I didn't really think that would be a great look on the cover. So Falcon was it. Yeah, well, I, I can <laughs> tell you, Mr. Mayor, my, my ward was really appreciative of the uh, underground water uh, yeah. pipe, so uh, thank you. Uh, my, my only another question I have, though, be serious, is the program that we talked about uh, helping people in need with the uh, loans if, for, uh, roofs, uh, boilers, and things of that. And you had mentioned that it's a 15 years if, if it will come off to be forgiven. What's the percentage of those, do you know a percentage of those that do not go 15 years and they repay it? Does it go back into that fund or does it go into the general fund? Yep, good question. So the, um, if, they, if the property owner sells the property before the 15 years, um, or and oftentimes if they refinance, it might be a requirement for them to pay off the loan. Uh, that money, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Jingers, but that money would go back into the program. So it, do you know, do we have any percentage of how many of, um, I know we haven't done this program, but in the past, how many of that uh, got forgiven? Or did that, do we recoup most of the money? I don't have that information on hand, but we certainly can get that for you. I think we probably can run those numbers. Um, I think a large portion of those are forgiven because a lot of times they're, they're um, either young families or seniors that 
just need that assistance and oftentimes they're holding on to their house because the, the, the work is usually more emergency work than enhancement work, does that make sense? Where it's, it's to, to fill a direct need or a direct problem rather than trying to improve their house to sell it. So um, I think most of the loans are forgiven over that 15 year period, but we can run those numbers and get that to you. Thank you, and I'm gonna have more questions when I'm hold off. Um, it's one of the ways I like is listening to uh, the presentations and questions from the other counselors. But again, um, I am concerned of the, um, what the tax rate or the amount of taxes increase is going to be on our constituents. But I do firmly believe that if we need to continue to maintain and increase our services that people are, are now coming to the city and expecting. And it, it's, it is difficult to uh, make that balance, but this city does a great job in doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Shress. Councilor O'Neill. Thank you, Chairman McGinn. Um, I certainly want to echo everyone's comments about the, uh, the department heads, all the staff in the city of Peabody. It's easy to say this, but there's no doubt about it. You folks did more with less the past year. Uh, less staffing money, le less people, and it's incredible. So it makes all of us look pretty good. So I do want to thank you all most of the department heads are in this building. Um, I know that we have a whole lot of other sections to get through, but I just want to kind of just talk in general about, you know, the, 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 the um, I guess the memo and then the, the big picture. And, and thank you for this presentation. Not only is it, you know, detailed, but the, the memo and then the, the PowerPoint and given additional information. There are three or four that, three or four topics that I just wanted to just highlight. Um, so for the public safety, the, the proposed police and fire positions, is it accurate to say those are union um, required to fulfill, you know, full staffing? Is that a fair statement through the chairman? It's not, it's, Councilor, it's a good question. It's not typically in the contract. It is, though, a city ordinance, the, the number that, um, that the staffing should be at. We definitely dipped below that last year with COVID, um, and that's where we're going back to. But it is an ordinance number. Thank you. I, I misspoke. It's, it's something that we, we, we need to have um, and, and should have. We want to make sure everyone's uh, kept as safe as possible. We did um, touch, all, touch base already on the, um, the IT position. I just want to clarify, it looks like we have the, the, the new position for the IT administrator, and then I think the total increase on IT was about 177000 so it's a $96,000 delta. Is that a contract with a firm who's going to give us ransomware protection? I, I don't know much about uh, technology, but you know, is that going to keep us safe? Is that the idea? Yeah, that's exactly it. It's approximately $7,000 a month contract um, to, to put software on uh, laptops and other computers so that they can monitor them. Thank you, and I, I just saw a program, and, and uh, it is the world we live in. They're attacking big businesses, Colonial Pipeline. There was a small town in Alabama that was had their uh, entire computers sh shut down and encrypted so no one could do anything with public safety or whatnot, so I'm glad we're taking those steps. Um, in terms of the, you know, the proposed budget, um, and I guess where we're gonna be possibly or proposed to take a you know, million dollars out of uh, free cash, what effect might there be from Moody's or our bond rating with our proposed approach for fiscal year 22? Um, I, I guess through uh, Chairman McGinn to the mayor or uh, Mr. Jingris. Yes, uh, that's certainly, um, and, and certainly Mr. Jingris can speak to it as well. Um, I think the pros that we have is uh, we have a significant excess levy capacity and we have um, a large commercial base. The downside is that we've taken on significantly more debt over the years, and certainly the biggest driver of that debt was the uh, Higgins Middle School and some other projects. So yeah, the uh, reserves, which has always been, um, it's been higher than it is now, I think uh, could have an effect on our bond rating. Uh, it's possible that we could get uh, reduced. Um, I think it's unclear at this time, but it's, it's a possibility. And, um, you know, it's one of those situations we always wrestle with every budget, how much to ask for, because, you know, it's the rainy day fund. I certainly think we need it at this time, but uh, the uh, credit, rating could be, credit rating could be impacted. Um, I can get that information to you um, as it comes up. Uh, we're set to be reviewed shortly, 
and we can provide that information. But it is very real that we could be uh, reduced. Thank you, and I appreciate the answer. It's not an easy uh, question to answer, given the, like you just mentioned, that rating day fund is for that. But I know that they, Moody's and the rating agencies want us to keep to a certain percentage. So I just wanted to make sure our eyes were on that. And, and lastly, um, just for, based on the presentation, the question is on page 17 of the presentation, um, there was uh, the MWRA water purchase, which I fully understand. I just was confused on, and certainly understanding we had to shut down the Winona uh, treatment plant to, to get it totally rehabbed. But I just was wondering why that wouldn't be in fiscal year 2021 versus 2022. Maybe I misheard, but it was a, it's about a $988,000 increase proposed, so I'm just curious. So, so the way the MWRA works is they bill us for a calendar year. So the calendar year, the end of December, goes into our next fiscal year budget. Thank you, I figured, I just was confused, but thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Councillor Turco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mayor, first, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, re-implementing the homeowner rehab program. You know, I know Council McGinn and I have been uh, on you about that for quite a while, so I, I really appreciate that. Secondly, with regard to Councillor Charest's comments, I'm just glad we don't have uh, Dr. Levine on the front cover of the budget with a dollar bill again. Um, I'm, I don't know how well that went over. Um, with regard to um, the IT department, we, we have three people currently in the IT department, and you want to add a fourth. But then the, throughout the budget, I, I, I know I saw at least one more maybe that works directly for the, the police department, um, an IT individual, and I'm not sure if there are others. Yeah, the, there's an IT person at the police department, and one of the firefighters actually handles a lot of the IT work over there. Um, so, so there's um, a, a dispersion of, of uh, different proficiencies throughout the uh, city. Um, but in City Hall itself, um, we're, we're asking for another position to really enhance what we do, and we, we've moved on to a lot more remote work. And even though the COVID's over, we're still doing um, more laptops and things, and, and there's, there's a lot more to handle. Thank you, and, and you know, and I understand that, and I know the importance of IT at this, you know, day and with this day and age. But I really, to Council Sasslaw's point, I really wonder if we should look at some consolidation of these people, since they seem to be all over the place. Uh, it, you know, specifically, I know we can't combine school and city side, but maybe the the five that we currently have on the payroll plus the addition of the six should kind of work under one roof, so that everybody's you know kind of talking to each other about this, but. I'll digress on that. Um, one thing that always pops out to me, or at least the last couple of years, is the landfill mayor. Um, we, we have high hopes for it, and then it never seems to, to amount. I think it did one year with the um, Crystal Lake rehab. We, we made some money off it. But um, the last two, I don't think that we, we really got anywhere. And I understand COVID, uh, but I expected with the amount of construction that we would make some money off it. So I, I did ask around it, and I've heard that our Landfill costs are much higher than surrounding land, landfill, so I'm wondering if maybe you know a reduction in the in the rate would get us more local business. So you know something's better than nothing type deal. Yeah, Council, you're right on on that. Um, I have been a little disappointed uh, in the landfill revenue. I thought there'd be more opportunity, and I think it could be just as simple as that. The price point. So. Um, we are going to be having a discussion on that because I, I still think there's opportunity there for us. We have uh, plenty of room to bring in Phil, and it can be a money maker. And maybe we're just not pricing it right. So I think you might be right on on that. And for now, Mayor, my, my last question is in regards to some things you said about the uh, police and fire department. And I know there's seven vacant positions in the fire department. I, I believe is it, is it eight or nine in, in the police department? I think with even some recent retirements, it could be more in each. Um, with some of the discussion that's taking place in Beacon Hill, um, you know, I know some police officers and firefighters are looking at 
early retirement, um, taking an earlier retirement than originally planned. So uh, those numbers could be even higher uh, at this point. I believe. So police, we have eight, at least in the book, and fire. Fire, we're up to 10. Okay, so with regard to those, I mean, going by your timeline that you just talked about, they're not all going to be hired at once. It, this may take, you know, over the full budget cycle to, to fill most of these positions. So I'm wondering why we're budgeting for the, the full 12 month period, because I, I think it would be a significant cost savings to the taxpayer right now if, if we know that we're only hiring four firemen immediately. And actually, this is in regards to all the positions. I'm really doubtful we're going to hire any of these people July 1st. Um, you know, I know Beth has been struggling, you know, with the staff that she has, and fortunately she has a couple added in. But I, I'm really doubtful that you know, 17 or so uh, public safety officials plus all these other positions will be hired July 1st. So why not reduce the tax obligation by lessening the amount we budget for some of these people? Uh, for instance, if we know that four policemen and four firemen aren't going to be hired until January 1st, then reduce the, uh, the budget by six months of those salaries and, and pass that on to the taxpayer. It's just, you know, I'm not saying I don't want to hire the positions. I want them, but we can't possibly fill them all by July 1st. So, you know, long term, why not cut a little bit of, of it up front? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Uh, absolutely. And I didn't do a very good job. I should have explained that. Um, we are staggering these salaries based on time we expect to be putting people into the academy. So like on just looking at the police on page 20, you'll see that there are a number of positions that are fully put in at, you know, 72, but then there's a number that are at 49, a number that are 33. So this, there are some that are done that way. We are the the advantage, the slight advantage in the fire department is that you can put people in and they can start doing, in, start doing internal training prior to going into the academy. Because I know the chief is, Chief Daly, um, you know, is looking for, looking for um, more firefighters. So we're able to get the firefighters over to them this summer and then he can get them ready for the academy. They can do internal training. You can't do that with the police. So as you said, what we've done is stagger them, figuring we're going to get One's this September, hopefully one's in November, December, another group in February. So they are staggered that way. Thank you, Mayor. That makes much more sense. My last question with regard to uh, police and fire for now is um, you mentioned the reserve list. And, you know, I'm glad to see that you're going to backfill the reserve list once we fill these positions. But uh, isn't there a, there was at one point that I'm not sure it still exists, a, a detriment to filling the reserve list to the city budget, uh, excuse me, the city retirement system, whereas if once you're on the reserve list, the city's obligated, um, obligation for retirement benefits begins. Um, so perhaps uh, Mr. Freeman can help us on that. But yeah, there is, uh, there has been a change in, in, in the law in terms of, of some of that service. Mr. Freeman, if that's okay, I'll turn, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Freeman. That's an excellent question. We're in the middle of doing a, a search now of every active police and firefighter on their reserve time. And depending on when they came in, and if they were compensated, regular compensation, the new definition, the old definition, they now have to buy that time. After the $5,000 rule in 2009, any reserve employed after that date must earn at least $5,000 in regular compensation to get credit for that. So essentially anybody after 2009, we don't, they're not going to get that reserve time free. They won't get the reserve, excuse me, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, they won't get the reserve time unless they make $5,000, which is, which is very possible because we call off the reserve list, uh, if I'm not mistaken, no? The fire department, to my understanding, does not employ their reserve firefighters. Now, if they work at DPW, they're already employed, so that's an entirely different story. But if they're just on the reserve list, if they're not earning regular compensation, and we can't count details, or they have to actually be employed as a police officer or firefighter to get credit for that reserve time. So we're no longer going to have that liability for reserves. Thank you very much. That makes me feel much better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Turco. Councillor Rosignol. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to echo my um, counterpart's um, admiration for the department heads. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for all you've done throughout these trying times. Most of my questions have already been asked and answered. The, the only two I really have now is um, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Mayor. Um, the business liaison position, um, how do you envision that position and who would they report to and what would be their primary function? Good question. Uh, I anticipate it will probably be similar to what we've done in the past. Um, it's been a part of the Community Development Office. I think there's a good working relationship between that office and, and community development. Uh, but I do want uh, the business liaison to be much more focused on attracting new business. I think it's critical uh, to continue to meet the needs of our existing businesses with expansion or just everyday assistance going through permitting and whatnot. But uh, I, would, I am hoping to be able to, to bring on somebody that will um, focus more on generation of, or generating new business opportunities here. Perfect, thank you. And then my last question, and it's really just, I, I don't know what it is, the new two junior custodians, is that just part-time custodial help? No, those will be, those will be full-time floating custodians. Um, floating positions. Yeah, just to, you know, right now we have, each of the schools has two, uh, the couple of the Brown and the Carroll have three custodians. The high school and middle school, I believe, have eight or nine. And then we have two here, two at the library, uh, one at the police station. And then we need a couple of floaters to help with uh, some of the other needs in the other building. So, no, we'd be bringing them as full-time positions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Rosignol. Councilor Manning Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I as well want to commend and thank all the city workers and the department heads throughout the, um, over the last year. Been very, very responsive to me from at the risk of leaving anyone out, I will apologize. You know, the health department, the um, police department, forestry department, city clerk's office, um, building commissioner, public works, uh, and really everyone who reached out to got back very quickly and was very helpful. And I think that's important for the residents to know. But I also want to thank the residents for being really understanding and patient throughout this past year. It's really been incredible, the amount of work that has been done and the cooperation and respect and gratitude from the residents for um, the work that you all have done. So I have heard that from my constituents and I just wanted to share that with you all. Uh, they appreciated it and, and we also appreciate the residents um, for, for their understanding throughout this year. Um, Along the same lines as uh, Council Saslaw had raised um, earlier, this, with this pandemic, you know, we've had sy systemic change in the way we do business everywhere, whether it's private industry or uh, public or in government. And so a lot of people have had to take on other responsibilities um, and maybe have not had to do uh, responsibilities of the past because, again, systemic change was required and changes were made and, and people adapted. So that being said, I also have some concerns about filling new positions at this particular time, uh, given that our finance, uh, financial outlook is still uncertain. I also want to thank you, Mr. Uh, Ging Gingras, for this, the work that you did putting this together, it's excellent. And I also appreciate you uh, getting me additional information that I was uh, hounding you for quite recently. I appreciate that. I know you're very busy uh, in preparing for this evening, so I appreciate it. And this, this is a great document. Um, and um, with respect to backfilling with new positions, again, Mr. Mr. Gingris, I appreciate you telling us that the expected property tax increase for residents is, is um, you're speculating $188,000. And last year was the first year we weren't able to let the taxpayers know it 
budget time because of the pandemic. And when we go through the budget every year, we're able, you know, we set the budget, we know what the budget in, what the tax increase is going to be. And last year, we didn't have that, um, that information. So I appreciate you giving us your best, your best guess. That being said, you also indicated that the commercial side will go down. So we know that we will hear from residents when theirs is going up on the average of 188 and the commercial will be going down. Totally understand the pandemic. Businesses have suffered, residents have suffered, uh, and we also know that the mall will be coming back for an abatement. Uh, understandable, they, they made a $10 million abatement because they were going under construction, that was an agreement. Then the pandemic hit and they've been hit as well. So totally understand that these are just bridges we're gonna have to cross. But that being said, the residents are still gonna see theirs go up considerably. What was it last year, it went up 70? Was it an average of 70? Yeah, it was 76. Now the average is gonna be 188. And we also know the larger the house, <coughs> the more expensive the house, the, the considerable um, amount more it's going to be for those individuals, just the facts. So um, that being said, that's where I'm at with filling new uh, positions and hadn't been filled before when the work was getting done during the pandemic. So with that, uh, in that regard, Mayor, if I could just very briefly uh, ask you about the half mayor executive secretary, is this adding a .5 on a .5? or is it a point 0.5? Good questions, good points you made. I, I, and I wanna thank you for those encouraging words earlier. I thank every, every counselor. Um, I know that means a lot to, to all of us. Um, and I did wanna say, because counselor, you're 100% right. Over the last 15 months, we've been able to see what works, what doesn't. You know, we did have a reduction in workforce in some departments. We did bring back some that I've proposed tonight uh, for your hopeful support. But there were positions that we did um, cut over the last couple years that were not funding, um, specifically some here in City Hall, which you know, has not been easy for some of the departments, but we felt we could make it work, and I didn't bring those back. Um, the collector's office, assessor's office, and the um, assessor's, collector's, and, and treasurer's office. So those, those departments are down one person that were cut last year, or within the last two years that we haven't brought back because we think we can function without them. Um, but that's gonna be very challenging for those departments. So yes, what we're looking to do, last year you may recall uh, Human Resources and my office, we split um, one person, or a .5 in my office, a .5 in uh, Human Resources, uh, because of the needs of the offices, uh, we'd like to add 0.5 onto human resources, a 0.5 onto the city of Peabody, so that uh, we're back to where we were pre-COVID. Thank you, excellent explanation, and I appreciate that you have consolidated. Uh, you might wanna lead with that next time. So, um, in regard to the 0.5 and the 0.5, and thanks for that reminder, I do recall that. Will the, these individuals, they already have health and, and pension, health insurance and pension in these positions, is that correct? So adding the 0.5 isn't triggering health insurance and pension, it's already there, is that correct? So let me think this through. One would be covered as already, they're already employed, they're already pension and salaried. There would be, there could be one more that could be pension. Yes, there could be one more. Counselor. I was just asking on the 0.5 May as executive secretary and the half uh, 0.5 administrative assistant in HR. What I think we're hoping to do is there's a 0.5 at human resources that would, that had been splitting with my office, that person would come over to my office for full time replacing uh, Mary Bellavance's position. So then we would be hiring potentially somebody over at human resources. That would be replacing, uh, sadly, Karen Meyer's position. Okay, so that will be one person. That so that will trigger health and pension. Okay, on that one, okay. Uh, moving on to business liaison, that definitely will trigger health and pension because it's not filled, and that's at 60,000. So with health and pension, we're talking 90 to like 100, depending on what health insurance plan they take. Right, okay. 
and the point five on the Board of Appeals secretary. Is that adding health and pension? And the part-time housing specialist, I, w I believe all that work, even though that gentleman that, and I remember him, very nice man, knew, knew his stuff, and you're right, he's been gone since prior to your um, term in office as mayor, but all that work's been being done. I mean, the loans are made and, and tracked, and all that work is being done in community development. I mean, it has to be, and we have to track when those when that housing will fall off our, our um, affordable housing rolls. So that is being done now, correct? No, there's been no, no loans in that department. Um, they, I guess they do track the work that's being done right now would be if somebody were looking to refinance that um, would come up as a mortgage on their property, so oftentimes they would ask us to, to allow them to subordinate their mortgage, um, and we track the numbers as they come off. But no, that work isn't being done. Uh, nobody has taken on that responsibility, and that's been an issue for us with the affordable housing number because the numbers are, as people come off the books, those numbers are coming off our affordable housing, and the hope would be that we would be able to utilize this program to add let's just say 10 new loans a year, that would offset the 10 that might be coming off the books and even hopefully even more so we would be able to, to add to that number. Does that make sense? It does, but I'm very curious as to how that, all that work hasn't and, or isn't being done on a regular basis. I, I don't, that I don't understand. Yeah, we just, we haven't in the past, back when Mr. Cello was here, that program was funded, and I have to double check, but I believe some of it was funded through uh, Community Development Authority, some of it was block grant money. We haven't had that program in place, so we've utilized that money in other ways, uh, in, in other programs, funding different, um, you know, some of that money goes to social organizations and charities like Haven from Hunger and other things. So what we would intend to do with, if we move forward with that program, we'd have to go to these entities, get some seed money, you know, uh, to be able to do these five, ten thousand dollar loans. But no, that, that program hasn't been in place. Okay, so it was covered by grants, as, as you said, or uh, other uh, pockets of monies. So that will be a new position that will trigger health and pension. Right now, it would be part-time. We wouldn't be, I wouldn't be looking to add uh, that as a, a health insurance position or a pension position. Part-time doesn't Part-time. That's why I put it in as, I put it in as 25,000. I want to see how it goes, see if it's successful. Right. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so, okay, thank you for that information, Maya. Um, therefore, I've, I've cut my list down, uh, given your, your Excellent answers, I appreciate it. And again, um, 180 to 200, 188 to $200 uh, increase for the residents is, is um, it, it's gonna be a lot for certain individuals, especially seniors on fixed income. And I just don't feel comfortable adding new positions, um, again, that will trigger health insurance and pension costs when um, that will be the result. So I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid off, um, Councillor McGinn, and I want to make a motion to reduce uh, the mayor's budget as proposed to fund the build business liaison by $60,021. So moved. Council Manning, I'm going to ask that you hold off on that motion until we get to the uh, general government section and then very happy to entertain that motion. Okay. We're I not there yet. I, 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 right. I, I just figured it would be much, much more expeditious to get through those if these are my, really my only issues in, in throughout the budget. So I'm just ripping the Band-Aid off. I'm trying to do you a favor. Yeah, I can appreciate that, but we're, I'd like to stick with uh, getting through just this uh, comments on the in questions on the overview section for us. Um, so if you have any, any additional questions, we'll take those now. Otherwise, other counselors? Um, 
Councilor Manny, you still have the floor. Do you do? You, are you? I'm thinking. Okay. Thank you, because I had expected to be able to do that. So give me one moment, please. Thank you. You, you, I guarantee you will have ample opportunity to make all the motions you choose to. I, I, so that is not a lost opportunity. No, the rest of these I'll have to wait till um, we get to the sections of the budget. Um, again, I don't, uh, I really don't have, I thought this was an excellent presentation, um, very sound budget, just a couple of, you know, a couple of things that I've already just mentioned that I wanted to address. Um, and lastly, it came up this evening, all the retired police officers that are coming up, and that, that reminded me, Mayor, since I have you, um, the forestry department was awesome. I had a lot of um, complaints about trees and tree removal, and the only uh, backlog they had was waiting for a detail because the, you ran out of offices for details. And it reminded me that you that I had raised it to you, it might have been two years ago, maybe last year, that I think the governor allowed retired offices to be able to come back and earn overtime and I think you're going to look into that. So I, I don't think you and I followed up on that, but I think um, you may want to take a look at that since we're going to have less officers on, you know, on the clock and more retired officers. And if we can't get police details, it, it's really going to kind of clog things up, not just with the tr trees, but with, you know, lots of other things throughout the city. So I do believe that you can do that. So I would ask you again to look into that and it might um, help things flow a little bit more smoothly to get to residents' uh, concerns. Um, and I want to thank uh, Brian Grant for all the help that he gave me with the trees throughout the last year. He's been excellent. So with that, I'll just wait till we get to the sections, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Annie Martin. Are the councilors? Councilor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to echo my thanks to the entire city staff, regardless of the department and how they handled the COVID and uh, all the requests that we had for assistance. And they were very helpful. Um, but most importantly, I'd like to point out, and you did earlier, uh, Mayor, but I'd like to point out that without Sharon Cameron's leadership, we would not have been anywhere near um, as uh, far along with our, our whole COVID uh, planning and everything that went into it. So I'd really like to acknowledge Sharon. So thank you so much, Sharon. You did a great job for us. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Council Gould. Seeing uh, Council Shrest, if you could be ex expedient, please. Thank you. I, I, I missed one of my questions, and it, it was reminded me with Councillor Manning were brought up. Um, and regarding the, um, the business li liaison, would we be, uh, I guess for the lack of better words, better off financially if we looked at that as a consultant role, a paid a percentage, depending on the businesses they brought in, the value of the business they brought in, and that if it is a consultant role that we want to be having that figured on a, um, a benefit package, um, the possibility to be added to that, which I'm sure it's already added into the, the uh, uh, numbers for health insurance for the overall um, group. But would we, would we be better off doing that with the, uh, instead of a 60, doing a... Uh, that's a good question, Councillor. Uh, I'm not sure if we're able to enter into those type of employment contracts, but that's something that we can speak to human resources about and, and maybe I can report back, but it's worth looking into. Again, Mayor, I'm, I apologize for bringing it up the second time. I just, I missed it on my sheet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shrest. Um, seeing no other councillors, uh, just to uh, a couple of comments really for me, more than questions. I, I would uh, add my thanks to the department heads uh, for navigating us through the past year. Uh, it really has been extraordinary. Um, you know, just when I look at this 
overview, there's a couple of things in here that um, jump out. One just being, you know, tough timing. The the 1.2 million for the extra pay period. That's that happens. Um, I, I, you know, that happens to us at work. It's about every 11 years. So Murphy's Law would have it that uh, it hits us at, at perhaps the worst possible time. Um, but that's a million too that it was you really. Um, have a hard time planning for. Uh, the Council on Aging, I'm really excited to see that funding being uh, moved up to 86%. I know that's an anomaly, um, but it's really necessary. That's been a tough situation at, at the Council on Aging. It's such a vital service that we are, uh, offer. It's such a, an important service that we provide and a real differentiator uh, for quality of life for our uh, older citizens here in PUD. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to see that's happening. Um, as Councilor Turco mentioned, the, um, we have been fairly vocal over time about the housing specialist. Um, thank you very much for uh, reacting to that. I think that is going to uh, very much uh, benefit the city. We we've saw that as we did the deep dive on the housing production plan. Uh, the, the number of units that have been falling off the SHI that we have not been backfilling and you know we can now reverse that trend if we get that position filled, uh, get some funding and start, it's, it's really was historically one of the uh, best means that the city had for generating units on the, uh, on the SHI and uh, I'm excited that we're going to be uh, moving back in that direction. Um, as for the um, the APA um, and how that's getting applied, I know there's significant restrictions on what that money can be used for. I think we're looking at it primarily for uh, revenue replacement and you know funding deficits at this point. To the extent that's going to be allowed, potentially even for the uh, for the skating rink deficit, perhaps if we get some clarification from the uh, Department of Revenue on that. Um, but this opera thing being new, it's it's like the newness we were dealing with, or I guess the uncertainty we were dealing with in the last budget cycle. So I appreciate your commitment, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, to come back with the Director of Finance uh, as we get into the fall and advance towards tax classification to get a uh, better understanding as to how these monies are going to be applied and what the impact is going to be um, and, and navigate our way through that uh, jointly. Um, and I am uh, extremely uh, appreciative of your comment, Mr. Mayor, about avoiding the, uh, or I, I guess the uh, kid in the candy store comment. I, I think there was real risk there. Uh, there's a, there, these opera funds are significant, um, but it, it's critical that we not uh, build a dependence on that money, that we use that prudently and uh, in such a way that we don't create a problem for ourselves uh, two and three years down the line. So definitely appreciate that approach to, uh, to using the funding. Um, one, one very minor thing, and I'd ask um, uh, most of the questions were asked and well answered by my colleagues, but uh, just on uh, slide nine, Mr. Jingris, um, this is a point that I know I brought it up in the past. I know Councilor Turco has brought it up in the past about the about the SESD refunds, and those are, we've, we're still budgeting those coming back into uh, the local revenues. But it looks like we're, we've we've brought those back in at a at a reduced number. So is the intent there to to kind of gradually wean us off that on the city side and bring that back and bring it to where it should go into the water and sewer enterprise? Yes, that's correct. We're trying to um, just kind of get through the next couple of budgets and, and just move that back to the water um, enterprise where it belongs. It's unrestricted, so we can use it here if need be. Right. I realize we can do it, but we're, what, what we can do and what the right thing to do is, right. Appreciate you agree, your agreement on that. Um, Okay, with that, we're now um, going to move into the big book here. So, again, as I uh, uh, ex 
explained in my introductory comments there, I want to take this by major budget section, so we're in the general government tab. Uh, so that is a number of departments, city council, mayor, financial administration, finance director, auditor, purchasing agent, assessor, treasurer, collector, legal, human resources, information technology, city clerk, elections, licensing board, cable, TV Commission, Conservation Commission, Planning Board, Board of Appeals, Community Development, Rent Control Board, Building. If, you, if any counselor has any questions about any of the detail in that section or would like to put forward a motion with respect to the detail in any of those um, department budgets in the general government section, uh, I'd like to entertain those now. Councilor Manning Martin. Yes, is the business liaison position in that section? Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make um, a uh, motion to reduce the mayor's budget for the line item of business liaison in the amount of sixty thousand twenty-one dollars. So moved. Councilors, you heard the motion from Councilor Manning Martin on the motion. Seeing none, Councillor Sasslaw. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I do think at this point in time, I understand why it might be necessary. I think we have made a big investment. Um, and I think one of the things that comes up all the time and it's been brought to our attention uh, by Council Manning Martin tonight is when we go full time, that's when we really start to kind of double down on the benefits and things of that nature and the pension. Um, I don't know if there's any will of the council, and I will throw out there that maybe, uh, I think even another council talked about tying the salary with the business, which I, I think is difficult to uh, calculate, you know, what's the, what's the impact on uh, city revenues based upon this position. So uh, I wouldn't go down that road, but what I, what I would uh, entertain or throw out there for maybe discussion uh, is the potential of starting with a, it is a half position, uh, and then maybe next year, uh, we come back and if we feel that we've seen significant gains um, because it is very difficult um, to define what this role does and what it adds to the bottom line. So, but I also come from the private sector. I do believe that there is some, uh, there absolutely is some value in it. So I, I just want to throw out there that I, I would like to maybe see if there's any uh, will of the council to possibly make it a half position. Thank you. Thank you, Council Sasso. Council Well. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up to Councilor Sasso's uh, suggestion, I just had a point of clarity. I, I know that Councilor uh, Charest had asked if this could be an incentive-based pay type position, which I understand probably not, um, or maybe that we're not able to do that. Uh, would we be able to do this as a no-benefit uh, eligible uh, contract position, is that something that the city is able to engage in? Good question. Um, anybody who works over 19 hours is automatically eligible for, uh, for pension time and for benefits. So it would only, it would only work uh, as a part-time position uh, to not be benefited if it was 19 or less hours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for clarifying. Um, whereas I agree with Councilor Manning Martin and, uh, and Councilor Sasslaw and, and Councilor Charest, um, hope that we could kind of trim down some of the spending. As the Ward 1 Councilor, which includes Centennial, I think it's, it's imperative that we add this. Um, I'd love to save as much as we can. Um, certainly, if there was an option to do it as a contract position without triggering um, the benefits in pension, I, I would be in favor of that. But if that's off the table, um, I would definitely support uh, this position being included because uh, I think it's very much necessary if you drive through Centennial Park, you see number of leases, number of vacancies. I think whatever we can do to attract more businesses there is going to help us with our commercial uh, tax rate and will benefit the taxpayer. So it's, uh, it's an investment I think is worth supporting. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Welton. Council Melville. Thank you, Councilman. Again, uh, through you to the mayor. This was a full-time position prior to the pandemic. I think somebody left and we just didn't fill it due to budget constraints last year. Isn't that correct? 
Yes, what I tried to do last year when the pandemic hit and we were reviewing our budget was any position that wasn't filled at the time. Uh, Deb McGregor had been operating as the business liaison. She, liaison. she had retired shortly before the pandemic. So I just took that opportunity to uh, try to save some funds where we could and to eliminate positions that there weren't people already there. So that was a position that we cut because of that reason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I was happy to see this position be re reposted in part of the budget going forward. Um, I think we're in competition with most of the surrounding communities to bring businesses in. And based off a couple of the last council meetings where there's some confusion about the process of applying for a special permit, I think that this position will not only help businesses, it will help this council. And I think it will help the city in bringing in those businesses and streamlining the process. So I'm all in favor of it. I, I'm, I was happy to see it in here. I, I completely understand my fellow councilors trying to take a look at the bottom line, and I support their efforts in that. But on this particular position, I'm fully in favor of seeing filled, and I look forward to working with the person going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Melville. Councilor Turco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I, I need to echo Councilor Melville's um, thoughts with um, the amount of businesses that we're seeing closing that we'll probably you know, continue to see close. I, I think it's, it's extremely important right now that we uh, work on getting businesses from the Cambridge, Boston area that want, want to relocate. We've had a lot come up this way, unfortunately, most on the trucking businesses. But you know, to have the business liaison um, in a position um, that, that could draw some of that business up here, I think is extremely important, more important than, it, than it's been um, in the past. So um, I understand that there's benefits. Um, I think you did reduce the salary a, a bit, Mayor. I think it, it, in prior positions it was in the 70s or somewhere, but regardless, it's $61,000 is, is not um, an excessive salary for a position like that. I think it would be beneficial to the city, so I, I would assume see it stay in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turco. Mr. Mayor, you'd like to comment? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, um, and Councilor Turco, you've been somebody who's you know worked to bring businesses to the city, and other councilors has, have as well. So that's certainly been um, an effort that we, as a board, have have made. I think if we do it right, I think if we have if we have the right person in place, uh, this could have great benefits to us, as, as, you, as you and Councilor Melville and others have spoken about. Um, I do think that this person. Uh, needs to be more involved in, again, recruitment. Um, but also there's other factors to the, to this, for this position. But I do think if we do it right with the right person, this can be a great benefit and more than pay for the salary and the, and the benefits and other things. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Turgo, still on the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so, so Mr. Mayor, I, you know, honestly, you just you struck on something. Um, I always believed with the last two position, people that have had the position, and, and, the, and this is not to be disparaging toward either, either one, they both did a great job. My, I don't think we should see them in the city of Peabody. I think they should be in surrounding communities drawing businesses to Peabody. I, I'm, I'm not sure if you know, um, I want somebody that would be 40 hours a week sitting in an office in community development, whereas I'd like to see them you know, in Boston, Cambridge, you know, wherever Beverly, Salem. Um, you know, working with businesses to bring them here. So, you know, I, I hope that's the vision you have, um, I, on, honestly, and, and I think at that point uh, it really works. Over the last year and a half, I think most of the council has become the business liaison. Um, it's good. It's good in a way. It's good in a sense that you know, I, I, Craig and I, at least I know, know 90 percent of the business owners in the industrial park because they reach out to us because there isn't that business liaison. But I don't think it should be that way. I think it should go through community development. Um, and then through us um, after that. So, again, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turco. Councilor Charest. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think we, we need to continue to move PBD forward and, and continue with our services, and this is one. Um, but I got to tell you, because of dialogue, it made me think about a lot of things. And, Council Millville, you hit on something that I think would be very important, and as long as this, this position would be allowed to work with our city clerk's office to make sure that the applications that come in front of us for special permits are completed and it, and it's, and it saves time, so we're not month after month, that business is not opened up to bring in revenue for us, our city, 
I'm wondering if, you know, if that could be worked with also because of, um, you know, how it, it gets, it gets very busy for our clerk's office when we talked about who was going to do on that. So I think with the conversation with that makes it even more sound that, um, you know, if there's something, as I said earlier, if it could be uh, compensated on bringing them in, uh, but I, I'm, I can be very um, satisfied with the conversations that we're having. And again, when Councilor Turk will talk about not sitting inside the city hall, being outside in the communities and bringing them in, we have some vacancy uh, uh, commercial space here. So uh, I, again, I, this is what I like about dialogue. It really kind of reaffirms my, uh, some feelings that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Shiraz. Councilor Rosignol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, being the chair of PBD Main Streets, you know as well as I do, one of the things that we've really been trying to focus on uh, downtown is recruiting businesses that will enhance downtown. I think this position will be vital for that uh, continued progress um, moving uh, downtown PBD forward. So I'm all in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rosignol. Council Saslaw. Thank you, Chairman. So, so I'm going to I'm going to be, be, be I'm going to support this. The only thing I'm going to ask of you, Mr. Mayor, is that that you hire somebody who has some acumen with this situation. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an analogy. When uh, people hire someone to do capital campaigns and things of that nature, Easter Seals, major organizations, they usually come within the network of people who have experience. They've done this. I'm going to ask you because I'm not looking for someone to help out fraud applications. I am looking for someone, as Councilor Turco said, to be out there, to pound the streets, to join maybe the uh, North Shore Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Boston Real Estate, whatever it may be. So, you know, I, I, I will support it. Um, we'll look at it in a year from now. If, if it doesn't do what we hope it's going to do, you know, you know we'll, we'll bring it back up. But I, I get it. I understand it. Uh, the will is not to go part-time. But as I said, I, I would ask you that. Um, when we do that worldwide search, that we really look for someone who has this uh, acumen and has been in this environment and is uh, willing to, um, you know, represent the city and be out of the office, not to be in the office. Um, I know they started off with a, a pamphlet they designed many years ago about how to, you know, how to get through the city and how to do certain things. I think we made a good start there, but I think we're all looking for someone, you know, for this type of position to really generate some type of revenue and some type of long-term employee. So I will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I think that's fair. Thank you, Council Sasslaw. Council Masoulis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Here I go again telling my old stories. In 1997, uh, that's very recent, Councilor. 1997. Well, anyways, uh, there was an empty industrial park off Walnut Street. And it was a fire site for about 15, 10 years. And no business would attempt to go there. And they tried to make a zoning change at the time. And what that zoning change was to change it from industrial to residential. Uh, I was the counselor then and I put a stop to it. And I said, that if we bring a business into this site, the banks will release money and this site will become successful. It'll be an industrial park. Well, anyways, I went into Boston and I went to the Chamber of Commerce and I had asked if there were any businesses that were willing to locate in Peabody. Well, let me tell you what came up. It was a junkyard, okay? Now, how was I going to get this through the city council? We disguised the junkyard as uh, the type of company that uh, takes cars, takes them apart, and hangs them on hangers, and they rotate, and, 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 bus and uh, customers come in, They'll see a fender, they'll see a light bulb, they'll see a whatever it is. I got that business to come before this council and say, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the company. I'm going, 
back a little time, but it was like an auto recycling company. That's what we called it. And I told the counselors at that time, I said, counselors, there's no way you could refuse this because you said no business would come here. I found a business. Well, let me tell you something. That company came in, this council passed it, and the next thing you knew, you knew uh, other, businesses start, other businesses started coming in. The next thing you knew, the industrial park was full, and that's the industrial park on off Tremont Street that's being built right now. I think you people uh, all know the history of that. But anyways, that's how we got a business in there. And uh, this is going back to uh, uh, 1980, to the liaison, all right? That's what I was then. I was a liaison. I went out and I brought a business into this neighborhood, and you know what? We created an industrial park because of that, you know? So myself, when, mayor, when the mayor got up and mentioned the industrial, with the uh, liaison position, I was going to speak on it, uh, but I had other things in mind. I wanted to ask the police chief a question and the fire chief a question, and I sat back and asked nobody and just let everything go by. And I just decided I had to speak up on this. My belief is an, uh, a liaison, the right liaison person in this city will fill industrial parks, okay? They will bring revenue into this city that this city has never seen before, if it's done right. And uh, my feeling on this, to pay someone uh, at the, of that caliber $60,000, that is not going to do it. If you want to do it, do it the right way. Go out, get a professional to do it, people, a person that knows what he's doing, that's tied into the business community and knows his way around. Basically, uh, I think I said what I wanted to. Thank you. And, and also, congratulations for all the hard work you people put into this. I didn't get the opportunity to say thank you. I appreciate it just as everybody else does. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Masoulis. Also, Walton, if you could be brief. Thank you, Councilor McGinn. I uh, always do try to be brief, uh, so I appreciate the prompt. But. Um, I did want to just mention, uh, as somebody who's done this type of work for quite a long time, I do want to caution that 60000 quite candidly, might not be enough to attract the caliber that we're looking for. Um, so I would suggest, you know, as we're posting this position, you know, I wouldn't go with a headhunter to do an executive search. You're going to burn through a lot of money really quickly. So if, if you want to maybe put together a small committee to help, uh, I know I'm very... Uh, comfortable with the capabilities of our community development and our HR office here, but I just want to set uh, the table that you know, some of these positions, in, especially in the city of Boston, are probably paying double that. Um, but I do think it's the right approach. I think it's the right start. And I think it's whatever we invest in this position will come back um, full. So thank you. Move the question. Thank you, Councilor Welton. Roll call on the motion. This, this is a roll call on the motion to move the question. Councillors Gould? Yes. Henning Martins? Sasslaw? Yes. Welton? Uh, excuse me, point of, so are we voting on Councillor Manning's first? Uh, okay, sorry, just can you please clarify that real quick? We're voting to, uh, on her motion to move the question. Thank you, yes. Charis? Yes. O'Neill? Yes. Matsoulis? Turco? Yes. Rosignal? Yes. Melville? Again? Yes. Roll call on the motion. Councillors Gould? No. Yes. Manny Martin? Yes. Sasla? No. Welton? No. Charis? No. O'Neill? No. Mutsoulis? No. Turco? No. Rosignal? No. Melville? 
McGinn. No. Motion, car uh, motion fails 10 to 1. Thank you, Council. Council Manning Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion to reduce the mayor's proposed budget with the line item of half Secretary Board of Appeals in the amount of $20,700. So moved. Councilors, you've heard the motion on the motion. Seeing none, uh, Councillor Shiraz. Yeah, could, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Could you just say it again what the motion was? Sure. Uh, to reduce the mayor's proposal to fund half secretary for the Board of Appeals in the amount of $20,700. So it's just a motion to reduce the budget by $20,700. So moved. On the motion, Council Sasslaw. Thank you. Councilman, can I use the book for a second? So, so just as a point of clarification, if we look at that line item, which is uh, page 16 under general government, I believe it is. Well, it can't be, I don't know. It's page 16 uh, for that. It says right now um, the salary is 41,400. I'm, I'm just want to clarify, is that the current salary going to go up 20,000 or is that the assumption that it was going to be in increased? I'm a little confused on, on that. The salary description under, it doesn't, it says, um, I don't even have a description, it doesn't have a department. It starts with James Collins uh, building department. Yes, Council, that's moving that up from a part-time position to a full-time position. That 41,000 is the 27 pay periods. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Anything else on the motion? Seeing none, roll call. Councilor Gould? No. Neely Martin? Yes. Sasslaw? Yes. Welton? No. Charest? No. O'Neill? No. Matsoulis? Councilor Matsoulis? Yes. Turco? No. Rosignol? No. Melville? No. McGinn? No. Motion fails. Other councillors in the general government section? Councillor Turco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is just a broad question with regards to it. It's, it repeats itself uh, in random places throughout the entire budget, but I'll start um, with salary page two. If uh, Mr. Gingrich could answer our question for me, I'm sure there's a logical explanation, but if we look at salary page two, and um, I won't put people's names on there, but the first person um, on the list, um, if you multiply his weekly salary times 27 pay periods, it, it equates to the final number. But if you look at the second person on the list, um, and you multiply that salary by 27 pay periods, it's off by a few thousand dollars. And that's you, you repeated at probably 15 to 20 different places throughout the entire budget. And I'm wondering why the salary listed um, doesn't equate to the weekly pay. And when, I, when I was doing the calculations, I may have left the 26 week pay rate versus the 27th week pay rate, but I'd have to investigate the reason why. Yeah, I'm, I'm not positive. I, I don't think that, I, I, I think I did it at 26 times the uh, weekly pay also. In, in, so, in some circumstances, I had put in the ordinance step increase and I, and I didn't reflect that in the, um, in the weekly rate. I, I just put it in the total. Okay, so is, is that a problem for our final number in the budget, uh, ultimately? All the, all the final numbers add up. It, it's just the, the weekly numbers, as you found, may, may have been a, 
off a little bit. Okay, thank you. If you could kind of double check that and maybe let us know by Thursday whether there's an increase in the budget because of it or a decrease in the budget because of it, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Turco. Other councillors, general government section. Seeing none, what is the will of the council? There's no other questions. I have, I'd, I'd entertain a motion to approve the mayor's fiscal 2022 mayor approved budget in an amount of $5,539,572 for general government. Councilor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, make a motion to approve the mayor's um, budget in the general government section as written. So moved. Councilors, you heard the motion from Councilor Gould on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Councilor Gould. Yes. Manning Martin. No. Sasslaw. Yes. Welton. Yes. Charis. Yes. O'Neill. Yes. Matsoulis. Yes. Turco. Yes. Rosignal. Yes. Melville. Yes. McGinn. Yes. Motion carries 10 to 1. Okay, Council is moving on to public safety. So this is police, parking clerk, fire, fire alarm, emergency management, dog officer, and park meter maintenance. Questions, Councilor Manning Martin. Yes, could I ask you to separate the fire portion, please, so I may recuse myself as my brother is a captain in the fire department? Please, thank you. Yes, we can do that. So um, let's, for simplicity's sake, let's take fire first. Councilor Manning Martin is, for the record, recusing herself. Same for me, Council President. And Council Saslaw, for the record, is recusing himself. So we're looking strictly at the uh, budget. We're looking at the budget line item totaling $9 million. $987,061. Questions from the Council of Rosigno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would that also include fire alarm as well as emergency management since they're both under the fire department? I, I just uh, quickly verified with the mayor that both of those employees that are the reason for the recule will, will fall under the fire department budget. So I think we're okay to deal with that one in isolation. Council Rosignol. If there are no questions, I'd make a motion to... Um, Council Rosignol, I'm gonna, there are, I think we have one question from Council Turco, at least. Yes, I'm sorry, I thought, I, I thought you had some questions, otherwise I would have threw you, Mr. Chairman, to the fire chief. Chief, you didn't think we were gonna let you, we have to get you up to the podium for a minute. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to you and your guys for the last year of, I, I know you guys were right there in the thick of it, uh, responding to houses. Uh, as a matter of fact, several in my neighborhood were um, right in the thick of COVID where I know it was a major concern for your, for your men and women. Uh, but I did just want to ask you um, one quick question. Last year, you mentioned the term brownout, which through my own ignorance, I did not realize meant the closure or the temporary closure of a, a station. If um, this budget passes July 1st, all our stations will be open, full capacity. Um, this does not lead to any further brownouts um, with the staffing levels as soon as they're filled. As uh, the mayor laid out, uh, due to uh, issues at the academy, uh, limited attendance, uh, we're slowly getting back up to speed. It's gonna take a while for us to catch up as well. So I'd say a better target date would probably be uh, uh, 
uh, January 1st, 2022. That's, I think we'd have the staffing at that point where it wouldn't be cost prohibitive and overtime costs uh, to, to open up uh, Engine 3 fully. Thank you, Chief. And with regard to that, on the current reserve list, we have, I think, six or seven on the reserve list? I believe six, one, uh, and one pending, I believe, yes. Okay, so if we were to immediately hire those six, we couldn't staff a, uh, a station because they're not, they haven't, some of them have gone through the academy, no? Uh, uh, negative, negative. We, uh, we do in-house training, and uh, per contract, uh, without academy training, we can only keep four on the line, uh, the fourth spot at Engine 7, so that is a limitation. Uh, but we can, after uh, roughly uh, three weeks, four weeks of in-house training, we get them right on the line. Thank you, Chief, that's all. Thank you, Councilor Turco. Any other questions from councilors on this section? Seeing none, Councilor Rosingall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed budget for the from the mayor, um, 02200, uh, the fire line, um, in the amount of $9,987,061, so moved. Councilors, so you heard the motion from Councilor Rosignol on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Councilors Gould? Yes. Welton? Yes. Charis? Yes. O'Neill? Yes. Mitsoulis? Yes. Turco? Yes. Rosignol? Yes. Melville? Yes. McGinn? Yes. Motion carries 9 to 0. Thank you. Yeah, could somebody please get the attention of Councilors Manning Martin and Saslaw? All right, well, we're going to take a uh, two minute recess for bio break.
less fire. So that is police, parking clerk, fire alarm, emergency management dog officer, and parking meter maintenance. Are there any questions from the council in the public safety subsection less fire department? Councilor Turco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the mayor. Um, mayor, you know, I brought it up in the past. We, we're not funding the police cruisers again. Um, I know your intent is to bring those up at the Capitol. Um, I, I, we have a major catch up to do, as has been voiced to me by, you know, pretty much half the police department. So if we, we could um, concentrate on replacing some of the older, older vehicles, it would be greatly appreciated um, so I can have coffee and peace in the morning. And <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I will be submitting, hopefully this week, to uh, the city clerk, um, Stanforth, a, uh, I think it's a, a small capital request, but as part of that capital request is definitely going to be police cruisers. I'm asking, I'm gonna ask for funding for six new cruisers, uh, also um, a fire engine, and uh, some communication equipment that uh, public safety needs. So uh, that'll be coming. Um, we're intending to get that to Ms. Danforth by this week, so it'll be on your agenda to be received next meeting. Councilor Turco. And Mayor, I appreciate that, but we, we did talk briefly, and you said you might be able to squeeze a seventh cruiser into that uh, capital budget. So if, if you can look at that before you bring it to us, I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that seventh one. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turco. Councilor Rosignol. If there's no further questions, I'd um, be willing to make a motion. I see none, uh, Councilor Rosignol. So um, make, have you subtracted it? Very good. You have the number I do. handy? Okay, very good. Proceed with the motion, please. Make a motion to approve the mayor's proposed budget for public safety in the amount of $11,656,930, so moved. Public safety, less fire. Correct. Councilors, you heard the motion by Councilor Rosignol on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Councilor Gould. Yes. Manning Martin. Yes. Sasbaugh. Yes. Welton. Yes. Charis. Yes. O'Neill. Yes. Masoulis. Yes. Turco. Yes. Rosignol. Yes. Melville. Yes. McGinn. Yes. Motion carries 11 to 0. Okay. We are now in the public services section. That's uh, streets and highways, public works, administration, garage, solid waste disposal, facilities, and cemeteries. Questions, Councilor Manning Martin. Thank you. I, I don't know what page it is, but through you to Mr. Jingris. Uh, the under facilities that You'll be coming to us for a transfer of funds uh, on Thursday for $202,635. If someone could find the <coughs> facilities page for me before I do, that would be great. Um, 35, thank you. <coughs> um, I don't. I have a 35. I get a lot of 31s and a lot of 30s. <coughs> yep. Thank you. I have no idea. So, is this number <coughs> reflected in this current number? Because you next. I know you're asking for a transfer of funds from this account for two hundred two thousand dollars six hundred thirty five thousand. Uh, let me explain. Yep. <clears throat> um, 
When the facilities department settled their contracts, we calculated out what the retroactive pay would be and anticipated needing approximately 200, it was $200,000. And we, we did that transfer and that's the transfer information um, that's in the budget. We get to the end of the year, a number of positions weren't fulfilled and there's funding available. So I'm requesting in the next budget uh, transfer request, moving that money out of facilities to other departments. <coughs> right. Should that be approved, which I don't see, you know, any reason why it wouldn't, then that should be deducted from the proposed 2022. So it's actually going to be 200, whatever that number is, 203,000 less, right? Because it says it's an 8.7 percent increase from 21 to 22 on the salary line. But if you're removing, if you're transferring out 200. $2,000, that's not an 8% increase because it's going to be gone next week. It's going to be transferred into another account, correct? We're working in 2021 for the, for the 2021. For the transfer, for these yeah. transfers. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Council Manning Mon. Council Turco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, through you uh, to the mayor. M mayor, so th this is the department that's now going to handle the school buildings also. Uh, yeah, it ha thank you, Councillor. Um, this transition hasn't gone as smoothly as I would have liked to it, had it been. It's kind of been a process over the last two or three years to, to bring the facilities in full, in total, over to here. So yes, going forward, the facilities department is fully under the city government and it will be taking care of our city buildings as well as the school buildings. Thank you. So that brings me to my next question. We see a, a reduction of $80,000 in public property maintenance. Um, how do we plan on maintaining all the school buildings um, with an $80,000 reduction? Now, I, in turn, I see the $133,000 addition for outside services. Um, I, yeah, I see that, Mike, and I'm just, I'm just hopeful because it, it really still is in line with where we've been in the past. Um, it's not too much over to add that amount, I think, what, 10 buildings? And as you know, Mayor, you know, we've had some maintenance issues at the, the Brown and the South, and, and um, you know, Brian Grant has been nice enough to take some of that on himself um, and, and do that for us. But, you know, in the future, are they, you know, is there a regular maintenance plan for the school buildings? Um, you know, landscaping, I, I know that our custodians in, in general don't do that type of work. So I'm just wondering if, if this is enough to handle the 10 added new school buildings. Good question. I think it's going to be a challenge. I think we can make it work. I can tell you that we're meeting. Um, it's right after the, the, so school's wrapping up. We were scheduled to meet, I think, right around, uh, not next week and the weekend, or the week after with uh, school department facilities, um, Jen Davis from Park and Rec to talk about uh, grounds, talk about parks, because I think right now there's, uh, it's not clearly spelled out as to who's doing what, and I need to get a handle on that. I need a little more time on that. The questions you ask are, are legitimate and real. I just need a little bit more time on that one. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Turco. Councilor Saslaw. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in, in that vein, I'm, I'm going to make a motion to reduce the request from two junior custodians down to one. I think you kind of hit it on the, uh, on the head. I, as I've expressed earlier, I'm very concerned about op uh, uh, adding new positions. Uh, and then you just said, Mr. Mayne, you kind of need to get your hand on it. So if it's, you know, I know that they probably worked as hard as ever, the custodians during the pandemic and the things they needed to be. Um, I'm not as... Uh, familiar with maybe some of the detail that Mr. Turco just got involved in. But uh, once again, I just think that um, we need to try and, you know, respect the facts of the taxpayer and try and keep the increases at a minimum. So I will be supporting, I'll make a motion to reduce, uh, Mike, like to make a motion to reduce uh, the request from the mayor from two junior custodians down to one junior custodian, which will result in an increase of 47,131. So move. 
thank you, Councilor Sasslaw. On the motion, where are you, where are you getting that number, 47? So I'm looking at the new, I'm looking at the new positions and uh, that was in the narrative in the mayor's memo to us initially. I'm working off of that. I assume that the new, new two junior custodians was 47,131. It was times two, it was gonna be two positions if I'm incorrect and it was only $23,000 salary in some odd sense, let, let me know. But I believe it was, I'm, I'm working right off of his narrative uh, that he sent to us regarding the new positions. Thank you, Councilor Sassler. So um, if we could just go, just because the, the numbers in the book all total up, so I wanna make sure we get it right. Um, and that might not track 100% to the letter. Um, so I think the motion relates to salary page 31 in the big book. And there, there's two line items in there that are TBA, junior custodian, and those both are in at $52,358.40. So just wanna make sure we're on the same. Can you give us a moment on that one? Let's uh, give us a moment on that And, and I'm also yeah, page you, 31. <laughs> Councilor Sasslaw, do you, do you see it now? I do, and I guess, and maybe the mayor's working on this now, but it says TBA custodian junior, it says 52, 358, and in the narrative it said 47, 131, so I think I was right in that those are two individual positions, but I see even an additional 5,000, so maybe some clarification from Mr. Jingris on the mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jingers. So, so what we did is we put in two new cus junior custodians, but we have them starting in January. So it, the, the total salary in there for those two people is 47000 Sorry, I should have clarified that. I didn't, I didn't explain that in, the, uh, in that document. Okay, but- So we staggered them. So going forward for, for if we were to approve both positions tonight and we came up and we're doing fiscal year 2023, it'd be a total of approximately 105,000 because we'd be funding them for the full year. Is that my, my assumption correct? That's correct. Okay, um, and once again, thank you for clarifying that. And once again, I'd like to make a motion to, uh, to reduce the two positions down to one for junior custodians, which would be in a, a reduction of $52,358.40, so move. You heard the motion from Councilor Sasslaw on the motion, Councilor Charest. Thank you, um, I, I can understand the, the need to, um, to reduce, but do, do we have any understanding why, you know, is this a, a COVID related uh, protocols that custodians need to do throughout our schools. It, it's, it's a little difficult. I know it's under the city budget now, but normally when in the past, if there was an additional custodian uh, add-on or I saw so many times cuts, we had a, um, a principal of that school where that position was gonna be to kind of talk to us about it. Um, can we have some kind of information on and the reasoning behind the increase of those uh, two positions. Thank you, Councillor. And Mr. Hafey's here, you certainly can speak to it as well, but I, um, it definitely is COVID related, um, the requirements in terms of um, cleaning buildings has certainly been elevated um, 
over the, uh, over the last 15 months. And there's certainly been an issue with overtime because of um, custodians being out for COVID and for other reasons. So the two junior, uh, floating junior custodians was just to provide some additional assistance in cleaning our schools and our city buildings. And uh, we just felt that that was needed. Thank you, Councilor Shress. Councilor Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to uh, Mr. Mayor. Could you just walk me through the rationale with hiring them in January versus one full-time hired in July? I know the school department really, you know, school's out for the summer, but um, I, I think I would be more inclined to want to see one custodian hired full-time right away. I know it doesn't make so much of an impact on the actual budget, but just curious as to what the rationale might be there. Fair question, and um, it's just been an issue in terms of hiring people. Um, the, we're hopeful that there's going to be interest in a lot of these jobs, but it has not been as easy to fill some of these positions as in years past. So we did stagger them just to try to reduce the budget a little bit, but have those slots available to get people in to assist. And that was, that was simply the rationale. Thank you. Uh, again, my only hesitancy, I think, following up with what Councillor Sasslaw uh, had mentioned, and, and I would be inclined to support uh, this as is, is I think it might be more prudent to hire one this year at that full range and then potentially add another. I just, I, we're still kind of uncertain financially what the impact's going to be long term, so I wouldn't want to add a position that we potentially would have to remove in the, in the subsequent year, that's all. But I certainly understand uh, the need to have additional staff, especially considering all the COVID protocols. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Welton. Other councillors? Seeing none, roll call. Councillor Gould. I'm sorry, could you clarify the motion, please? This is Councillor Sasslaw's motion to reduce a junior custodian salary from the proposed budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Position? No. Mary Martin? Yes. Sasslaw? Yes. Welton? No. Charis? No. O'Neill? No. Mansoulis? No. Turco? No. Rosignol? No. Melville? No. McGinn? No. Motion fails. Nine to two. Other questions from councillors on the public services section of the budget? Seeing none, what is the will of the council? Councilor O'Neill. Thank you, Chairman. Again, if there's no further questions at this time, I'd move to approve the fiscal year 2020 2022 mayor budget, mayoral budget for public services, eleven million nine hundred seventy-seven thousand three hundred thirty three hundred thirty-three dollars. So moved. Councilors, you heard the motion from Councillor O'Neill on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Councillor Gould. Yes. Manny Martin. Yes. Sasslaw. No. Welton. Yes. Charis. Yes. O'Neill. Yes. Mitsoulis. Yes. Turco. Yes. Rosignol. Yes. Melville. Yes. McGinn. Yes. Motion carries 10 to 1. Okay, we're moving on now to human services. This is uh, drug-free communities, health administration, school health administration, council on aging, disability commission, veteran services, and community programs. Questions from the council. Councilor Melville. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to Mr. Gingras, or it could be Carolyn, with regards to the Council on Aging. So we're taking, we're going up from 49% to 80, what was the number? It's like 83% or something like that. Um, and that is just for this fiscal year? That's, that's what we're looking at right now? Or is this also going to be dependent on, I know the mayor had mentioned we'll, get, we'll have some further meetings down the road to see how the friends do on you know, some of the events that they have? 
Yeah, I think initially when we were putting the budget together, um, the Council on Aging uh, was feeling like they might be able to contribute $300,000 to their budget. Um, and, and that may change going forward as things open up, um, but we budgeted for that. Um, and, and hopefully over time, um, you know, we can in increase what we um, support for this uh, Council on Aging, but, you know, draw back a little bit. Thank you. Um, I know Carolyn did quite a bit this past year. I know other people have mentioned it. They, she kept everything on the tracks and folks were cared for that probably would not have had the same care if, if that place wasn't operating. So you and your whole staff did a great job. Um, and I know that this is a great example, Mr. Mayor, and I'm not, you know, that of, of we don't, there could be a fluctuation on income based on what the, what they typically, your, you know, council is going to do in their events this year. Um, so I, I'm glad to see this. I think this is a outstanding example of how COVID relief funds should be used and where they should go. This is exactly what the federal government was one, a great example of federal government wanted some of these funds to go. And I think this is a great use of those funds. So I, I commend everybody involved. Um, because these are the organizations, unfortunately, when the when situations like this happened last year that I was very concerned for. Um, so I, this is I'm glad to see this. And I think that this is a great use of funds. So um, thank you for that. And I appreciate the uh, everything you guys did at the council, Carolyn, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Melville. Councilor Turco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this uh, this this whole uh, section here is a, is a group of amazing people um, that did an amazing job for the last year and a half. Um, you know, more recently, I, I think it's actually probably the first time in a year that I spoke to Carolyn Wynn, and she informed me of some of the things that she's been doing over the last year. And, and I just wish more of the public knew um, that closed doesn't mean, clo mean closed. Uh, you know, they, they see that, that the door is locked, but there's a whole bunch of people working really, really hard to do some things uh, for our residents. And, and I really don't think this is a group here that's, that's in it uh, because they're, they're killing the world with finances. They're, um, they do it because they love what they do. So I just want to say thank you to, um, to, you know, to Sharon Cameron and Carolyn Wynn and um, you know, everybody else in this section. But, um, additionally, Mayor, I had one question. The drug-free communities um, support, there's, there's no funding there. Is that still completely under a grant? Um, and that's, that's why we're not funding anything. Yes, there's, the, there's been times in the past where the Healthy Peabody Collaborative, a grant had expired uh, and they needed some additional assistance for that period of time. Right now they are fully funded uh, through grants and I think that's for the foreseeable future. So yeah, that, that's, that's what accounts for the zero request. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, you know, uh, on that subject, uh, you know, it's near and dear to me. Um, drug abuse runs rampant in my family. Um, I know uh, Council Manning Martin has, has done a tremendous work uh, to try to raise money on behalf of the City Council for this. But uh, isn't there this, this funding additionally, just like we threw at the schools for, um, you know, to react to the pandemic? where we can react to the drug issue um, in this city. And, and I'm wondering through APA uh, if, the, if there's money is available that you could actually add to this. Because I think we, we've, we've been in a pandemic for decades, uh, but I think that with people losing their businesses, um, you know, uh, issues of people losing family members, some of the things that occurred over the last year, I think you, you're going to see the drug issue rise. And I just wonder if, if we have a plan to address it other than um, the two great women that work in the drug-free communities, and, and I know you have addressed it in the school system. I, you know, I, I see that coming up Thursday, but on the city side, I'd just like to see us do a little bit more um, to help. Uh, most of you know um, I lost two siblings um, in the last year to, to drug overdoses, so it, it is um, extremely near and dear to me. So I, I would like to see us as a city of 55,000 people react, and I know Sharon does um, work with this also. But uh, you know, the more the merrier, I say. I just, it's really important to me, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turco. Seeing no other councilors, what's the will of the council? We are in human services, Councilor Manning Martin.
this time I'd entertain a motion to approve the mayor's fiscal 2022 proposed budget for human services in an amount of three million nine hundred thirty one thousand one hundred and thirty eight dollars I'll move mr. chairman councilors you heard the motion from councilor Manning Martin on the motion seeing none roll call councilors Gould yes Manning Martin Saslaw yes Welton yes Charis yes O'Neill yes Matsoulis yes Turco yes Rosignol Melville yes again yes motion carries 11 to 0 we're now in the culture and recreation section. This is George Peabody House, the main library, the recreation, parks, Brooksby Farm, Tilly's Farm, Forestry and Historic Historical Commission. Questions from the council? Councilor Manning Martin. Council, would you mind if I jumped in real quick just yes, for a moment? Right, Thank ahead. you very much. I appreciate that. I just want, um, Carolyn Wynn did have a handout that she wanted to present uh, to the um, City Council just with some information on, on her Motion operation. And Councilors, you heard the motion from Councilor Rajnaud to receive the late communication on the motion. Seeing so none, moved. all in favor, any opposed, it's a vote. Thank you, Council. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Again, we're now in the culture and recreation section. Questions from councilors. Councilor Manaman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, under the library, page 45, um, again, we have a transfer of funds next week for about 113,000 coming out of the library fund for 2021. Um, so given that, I just wanna make sure that our library is fully funded and that we don't have any unforeseen uh, shortfalls into next year, as we had run into last year with their accreditation and, and perhaps other issues. So I just wanna make sure that they're fully funded <coughs> and again, through you to Mr. Gingras, if we take 113,000 out of the 2021 transfer, right, then it's no longer at 895, the salaries. Because you have a, in 2021, if you have a 13% increase from what was budgeted. But if we remove the 113 out, it's not a 13% increase, it's like a wash, right? So can you explain that to me? So similar to the facilities, um, we had made a transfer um, into the library budget to um, increase their appropriation so that we could go to the library um, to commission to, to maintain their accreditation. At the end of the day, for this current budget cycle, given the COVID circumstances, that funding won't be needed in FY 2021. We'll move that out and, and help another department. But the budget itself um, in FY 2022 is adequate to meet the um, accreditation purposes. But you see what I'm saying is you have 125,000 proposed change from 21 to 22, but you're taking out 113, right? You're taking out 113 from the 2021, yet you say you're adding 125. So you're essentially putting it back in, so it's not going to be a 13% increase, that's what I'm saying. So those things, 
just moving forward, that's kind of my whole issue with the transfers, that we get a running tally throughout the year to see when we transfer things from one budget to another. When we get to, uh, w from one department to another, when we get to the budget time, that these increases are based on the true number after the transfers. That's my issue. Uh, so moving forward, if we could get that information throughout the year and um, if it could be reflected in the budget, what transfers were out. That way we know if we're underfunding, underfunding a department or overfunding another department. Again, just to have true numbers, because we'll vote on this tonight and it's going to change Thursday. And, uh, and so these numbers and the percentage increases aren't really true. That's my point. Thank you very much. By true, I don't mean misled or false. I just mean accurate once the transfers are made. I don't want to be misunderstood. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Manning Martin. Other councilors? Councilor Turco. Thank you. Um, Again, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I know I have no authority to uh, spend your spend uh, money here, but um, the tree uh, department, it, it, people are amazed that it's what I tell them, that we have three people in the tree department. Um, there are so many tree issues throughout the city that need to be addressed, and I, I just wonder if we've addressed, are there any out, um, outside, I, I don't see anything where it addresses outside contracts for tree. I see mowing. I see bike path maintenance. Is it under roadside maintenance, which is actually reduced, or is there anywhere for outside services for the tree department? Um, I believe we do have for outside services. Um, yeah, page 50 outside services. We did bump it up from 35,000 to 37,500. Not a significant increase, $2,500, but. Uh, we do have some money for outside services. There are trees in certain projects that um, we need outside assistance for, so that's where that funding is. Yeah, I, again, Mayor, I, I know, I, I, you know it's beyond my purview, but I just, again, my recommendation is that these guys, uh, you know, I, I don't, I've, sent, I've sent you the list a few times, Mayor, the, the list of trees. <laughs> you have a list. And <laughs> I, I do, and, uh, you know, and it continues to grow every day, I think, for all of us. And, uh, you know, some consideration for some outside help might be, uh, you know, prudent. But that's so just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turco. Councilor Shires. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on Councilor Turco, as the mayor knows. Um, you know, trees have a, a lifespan, and especially in neighborhoods when they get to be older and they're reaching that 60, 70 year lifespan uh, of, the, of the tree, they all seem to be one after the other. So I, I, I think, you know, next year, obviously, again, not in our purview, but we, I call Brian constantly, and I know that uh, all other wards counselors do the same. And it's just amazing how much um, tree work we actually need to get done. So just I, I know you're doing the best. I just want to put my two cents in. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Shress. Other councilors? Seeing none, what's the will of the council? Councilor Rosignol. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'd like to make a motion to approve the mayor's proposed budget for um, culture and recreation in the amount of $3,948,142, so moved. Councilors, you heard the motion from Council Rosignol on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Councilors Gould. Yes. Minnie Martin. Yes. Saslaw. Yes. Welton. Yes. Charis. Yes. O'Neill. Yes. Matsoulis. Yes. Turco. Yes. Rosignol. Yes. Melville. Yes. McGinn. Yes. Motion carries 11 to 0. Moving on to debt service. Councilor Turco. Mr. Mayor, if you could for one second, I, I neglected to ask you one question through all of this. Are we returning the six weekers um, to the budget for, for help with these departments? 
not to the extent we have in the past, but yes, there are some positions. Yep. Thank you. My apologies, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councils, we're on the debt service section. Questions from the council? Seeing none, what is the will of the council? Councillor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion to approve the mayor's recommendation on debt services um, in the amount of seven million six hundred and seventy-five dollars and eighty seven million six hundred and seventy-five thousand oh eighty-three. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Councillors, you heard the motion from Councillor Gould. On the motion, seeing none, roll call. Councillor Gould. Yes. Manny Martin. Yes. Saslaw. Yes. Welton. Yes. Charles. Yes. O'Neill. Yes. Matsoulis. Yes. Turco. Yes. Rosignal. Yes. Melville. Yes. McGinn. Yes. Motion carries 11 to 0. Councillors, we are now in the employee benefits section. So this is PBD retirement system, workman's compensation, employee benefits, insurance administration. Questions from the council. Councillor Melville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a couple of questions regarding the retirement fund. Um, are we are we currently? What is our current percent funded of the of the our current retirement fund? Is it in this? It's in the early sixty percent ish, so roughly. So based on Mr. our last Freeman. actuarial, which was January of twenty twenty, prior to taking a market hit with COVID, um, we were at about forty nine point eight percent. We were under fifty, slightly. And are we still on track? Was it 2038 or something like that, that we're going to hit so our number? 2036, it's got to be funded. So we, we're kicking the can further down the road, but the end of the road is in sight. Okay. Through, uh, so, but our, our contributions are consistent with us meeting that goal, correct? The, the annual contributions is uh, 11601000 is, is consistent with that actuarial it increases every year. So that's what the Commonwealth says when they look at our actuarial, the percentage of growth, member contribution rates, because now members are contributing 9% plus 2% of everything over 30. We're on track to reach it, but that, that number does move every two years when we do a full actuarial study. And it also is impacted by, based on the, the market volatility. And, I'm, and would you say it was done in January 2020? January 2020 was the last actuarial, but they've also changed the, the mortality table that, that they've used in the past. People are living much longer, um, so we are paying pensions longer than we had in the past also. Okay, so, but our contribution is consistent with the, with the requirements that the state has and based off the actuarial. I guess what I'm saying is we're not going further down in years. We're increasing our funding of it to make it based off that specific year, would you say 2036? 2036 is when it's going to be funded, yes. Okay, so by 2036, we're, our, we're going to be funded at that point is, is what I'm getting at. It's just a matter of that our contribution might increase based off of market volatility and, you know, the compensation of employees. Right, so we've made, our, our investments have made significant gains this year. So when we do the next full actuarial, we, we are going to pay more to fully fund the system on time, but how much we fund may be reduced. For some reason, I thought in the Globe they had us at 63%, but maybe they got some... I, I thought the Globe... Uh, there was a Globe article that listed all of the retirement board in mm -hmm. the last... And I think I thought we were at 60-something percent at that time. Maybe, maybe they're incorrect, but uh, it could be based off of the gains in the market, too. Okay, that answers my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Melville. By the way, a great question. We never want to lose sight of that one. Um, questions from other councillors? Seeing none, what is the will of the council? Council Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move, uh, make a motion to move forward on the mayor's recommendation for retirement 
uh, in the amount of $11,616,497. So moved. Council Go, I'd like to take the entire section. So that would be um, employee benefits and the total. Twenty-seven million five hundred and twenty-nine thousand four hundred ninety-seven. So moved. Councilors, you heard the motion from Councilor Gould on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Councilors Gould. Yes. Manning Martin. Yes. Sasslaw. Yes. Welton. Yes. Charis. Yes. O'Neill. Yes. Masoulis. Yes. Turco. Yes. Rosignol. Yes. Melville. Yes. McGinn. Yes. Motion carries eleven to zero. Okay, councilors, at this time we're going to move forward to the um, water and sewer enterprise. So we're at the back of the big book, page Councilors, we're going we're gonna to actually um, go to recreation, um, but before we do that, we're, we're going to take just a one-minute recess, So, um, and I'd like to please try to keep it to that so that we can get through this. So uh, quick one-minute recess. Councils, we're going to we're going to resume. If you could please take your seats.
Okay, Council, as, uh, as I said just before we took our brief uh, recess there, we are going to actually go to the recreation enterprise first. Um, so questions from the Council on recreation, so that's either golf course or skating rink. Seeing none, um, the just a point of clarification, um, if you go under the golf course tab and flip advance to page 60, you're gonna see at the very bottom of that page, total recreation enterprise. Uh, you will note on that sheet that there is no expense for uh, debt service and you, you probably heard, you picked up on uh, that Mr. Gingras uh, indicated he wanted to have $100,000 in there for the CDA loan. Um, that was reflected in the overview presentation so it's not new information, it just didn't make it into the book. So uh, the total that's being advanced here as the proposed fiscal 22, 2022 budget is $100,000 greater than what um, is indicated here. So that total would be $2,252,096. Councilor Sasslaw. Thank you. And I just had one quick question I forgot to bring it up earlier. I'm just, I know we leased the skating rink. Why do we have debt service of 93,000? My mind's foggy. I just want to reiterate. I just want to remember why. Thank you. Good question. So, uh, that was a project we did in 2013, in which we um, did new boards, new um, a new ice refrigeration system. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Meeting Man. Thank you. Thank you. Along those lines, Mayor, we don't own that building. DCR does. Yet we're dumping all this money into it. Okay, thank you. So we have um, it to 2027, and uh, I'm gonna probably initiate some discussions soon. But yeah, they will not fund improvements. It falls to us. So I know that's a fight we talked about last week that we wanna take on, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Thank you, Council Manning Mon. Council Melville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're doing we, we, this is we can discuss the golf course. We're not doing that separately, great. Right? That's part of the recreation point. Correct. Okay. It's the Very combined good. entity at this point. Uh, I'm just glad to see that these these this capital work is being done. This work is actually being done. Peter, good job. I know you've been out there all year, um, and uh, you know it's a huge investment. It's a revenue. It's going to be a revenue generator. Um, and too many municipal. I deal with a lot of municipal golf courses, and too many of them fall into disrepair. Uh, because they become a place to, for cities and towns to pull money for other projects and whatnot. And, and I think uh, the city's being very responsible with how we're dealing with this particular golf course. It's a really great course. It's well maintained, it's well managed, and uh, I'm just happy to see it being invested and in, continue to the investment. Um, even, we have the golf carts now that are GPS, so it tells you how not far you hit the ball. Does not help me, and does not help me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. If I could, Mr. Chairman, real quickly. Thank you, Councillor. I want to make sure. I think. Uh, I hope everyone's had the opportunity. I mean, I know everybody knows Peter Cronin. He's been with us, doing a great job for a while. Um, next to him is Eric Still. Eric is the. I know it's not not his the exact title, but he's the groundskeeper. He's doing all the work uh, that's really made, superintendent, and he's really made a difference. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody, I don't know if everybody's met Eric yet. He's been with us, it was right before COVID, right? A couple of, yeah. <laughs> Has it been three years? Wow. No, but we have a real good team there, and I'm glad, um, you know, they've done a terrific job this year. It's been one of the bright spots, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilor Weldon, as long as it's not a criticism of Councilor Melville's golf game. 
<laughs> no, Mr. Chair, uh, and I do plan on supporting this. I, I do just want to ask a question um, since we have uh, uh, Peter and Eric here uh, with their expertise. Is there an opportunity um, with the asset we have with the golf course to maybe attract additional commercial investment, whether we had talked briefly last week um, about possible, whether it be whole sponsorships, cart sponsorships on an ongoing basis? And um, there's some discussion, but we didn't really have uh, too much clarity on that. I wasn't sure if that's something you might be aware of. Council, do you want to, want yeah, to through, you address through mayor, that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to, um, to either Peter or Eric. Mr. Cronin. Yeah, Peter Cronin, yes, yeah. Um, the only, I think right now, the only thing we have up there would be uh, maybe um, some advertising actually through the golf carts, as I mentioned with the GPS. Um, we, we got those in uh, in October, just before COVID hit. And um, that was on the plan was to get advertising. But at the same time, I didn't think it was really the right time to reach out to the businesses when a lot of them were shut down to ask to see if they wanted to do some advertising. So um, we still have another year um, with the GPS, and I hope that we renew or at least try to stay with that. So that would be, I think, one of the opportunities. When we first opened, uh, we were having um, granite tea markers and we had advertisers um, that we could put on those. Um, we could maybe do that with uh, the whole signs. We could do something like that. Um, that's, that's, that's an idea that we could do, sure. Great, thank you. And the question initially was um, if that would be allowable within you know, the, the lease uh, restrictions potentially for the land. But um, I think you guys are doing an amazing job. I've had a chance. I also am a terrible golfer, but I like walking around and looking for ball. Um, but I think you're doing a wonderful job there, and anything we can do to get more revenue to increase the quality over there, I think would be great. So thank you very much for both of your efforts. Thank you, Council Well, Council Shrest. Thank you. I, I just had a question, and it is not criticism of Mr. Melville's golf game, but I just want to understand, the golf carts actually GPS the golf ball, so you don't have to watch where the ball goes anymore? It brings you to the ball. Just explain it to me, because I, 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 I gave stress. up golf a long time ago when the club went further than the ball. So this. Thank you. You still have to be able to hit the ball, Ed. GPS or no GPS, yeah. OK, councilors, it's been a long meeting. We're just going to stay on track here for the, for the tail end of it. Um, Peter doesn't golf. I, I, I do golf, just not as much as I, just not as much as I'd like to, Councillor Manning Martin, but Councillor Gould. Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to make a motion if, uh, if you're ready. Yes, please proceed, uh, Councillor Gould. I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the mayor's recommendation for the recreation phase of uh, the budget in the amount of two million two hundred and fifty two thousand ninety six dollars so moved chairman councils you've heard the motion from councilor gould on the motion seeing none roll call councilors gould yes manny martin sasla yes welton charis yes o'neill yes Matsoulis. yes turco yes rosignol yes melville yes mcginn Yes. Motion carries 11 to 0. Okay, moving on to the water and sewer enterprise. Questions from the council? Seeing none, what is the will of the council? Councilor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move, uh, make a motion to move forward on approval of the mayor's recommendation for water and sewer fund. I believe the amount is two million three hundred and forty-nine dollars, three hundred forty-nine thousand six hundred and seventy-three dollars and twenty-five cents. 
that correct, Mr. Chairman? It's, um, I'm gonna, you gotta get the aggregate, so it's, it's uh, $18,493,234. I was only off by 16 million. <laughs> Just rounding, so, rounding so error. So move, Mr. Chairman. Councilors, you heard the motion from Councilor Gould on the motion. Seeing none, roll call. Councilors Gould. Yes. Millie Martin. Yes. Sasslaw. Yes. Welton. Yes. Charis. Yes. O'Neill. Matsoulis. Yes. Turco. Yes. Rosignol. Yes. Melville. Yes. McGinn. Yes. Motion carries 11 to 0. Okay, uh, councillors, we've we've uh, done everything tonight that we set out to do on the agenda. Um, we're we're going to recess this uh, meeting until Thursday. We'll pick it up with the uh, school department budget as well as the other items uh, that you see on the agenda. A couple of which were alluded to uh, during some of your comments tonight. So. Uh, you heard the you heard the motion from Councillor Gould to recess. All in favor? Any opposed? It's a vote. We'll see you all on Thursday at six o'clock. Thank you.